Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our conference on polycrisis and policy frameworks. I am Angus Armstrong, Director of Rebuilding Macroeconomics at the Institute for Global Prosperity. Today's conference is the first of four uh, conferences we're planning to hold for the 10th anniversary of the Institute uh, for Global Prosperity, IGP, founded and director, directed by Professor Dame Henrietta Moore. IGP's vision is to build a prosperous, sustainable global future underpinned by principles of fairness and justice, and we are very pleased to play our part in that. We've chosen the theme of today's conference because we believe that the premise for policymaking is changing. We're joined by three wonderful speakers who will share their perspectives on policy crises. Michael Muthukrishna, followed by Clara Matti online, and Alan Kerman, uh, who's just come in from Paris this morning to join us. The very distinguished scholars, and I'm sure we'll get a lot from the discussion. So I'd like to start by thanking our guests very much indeed for, for contributing. Thank you both. Now, before I introduce my guests, uh, I'd like to say a few words about rebuilding macroeconomics and where we are, and why we actually chose this topic as our first event. We began six years ago, and our goal is a rather lofty one, which is to transform macroeconomics back into a policy-relevant social science. We started the research network at the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, and in 2022, we transferred to UCL. We supported 34 research projects, which led to 87 working and discussion papers. And according to Research Fish this morning, we've held 83 public events, which seems quite a lot, and have over 140 publications. Now at UCL, we're changing things a bit. We're adding research and teaching. So last year we had our first postgraduate course and I'm just delighted to see a couple of the students here, welcome. This year we've just launched a PhD program called Social Macroeconomics. And next year we hope to have a full master's degree, which we think will be the first critical modern economic thinking graduate program in the UK. So what is rebuilding macroeconomics really all about? Well, in short, we interpret the economy as in a system for creating and using knowledge. Now we use the word knowledge to differentiate ourselves from information because knowledge can never be complete. In all walks of life, we make choices today to achieve an outcome tomorrow, but of course, tomorrow can never be known with real certainty. Now, orthodox economics have wonderful ways of getting around this. I mean, you know, it's impressive. We have full information, rational expectations model, where you know the variance of the shocks and everybody knows the model of the economy. And then if you don't like that, you can have several different models and the game is which one is the best one to use. We have robust control theory for that. And if you don't like that one either, you can have models where we don't even know some state variables, but you can impute them from the rest of the economy on a, um, by using a, a recursive system. In fact, one of the working papers on our website was written by the Bank of England, and they used an artificial uh, intelligent agent as the means of solving the problem. Uh, the good news is they did solve the problem, so it does converge into an equilibrium. The bad news is that if you converted that into human time, it would take about 100 years to find it. So there's pros and cons. So all of this requires, of course, you can make a prior assessment of the risk that you haven't seen yet. And also that you have certain things that are well behaved, like the variance of the shocks. So in, so in fact, you've subtly turned uncertainty into information by saying you need to know some things. But the question we want to ask is, what if this just isn't the case? And this goes back to Keynes' 1937 article where he says, we just don't know. Now, a lot of people like to leave the quote there, but actually in the very next sentence says, but this is what we do about it. We have to overcome that unfortunate fact. And the common thread in many of the research papers that we supported is actually how we do do it. Because the strangest thing is, just ignoring uncertainty isn't about measurement error that you say your models don't fit as well as they should. That's not the point. You miss the big question, which is, but how do we do it? Because whatever we do do, we do it really well. 
Robert Lucas was very candid about this in his book on the business cycle in the mid 80s. And he said, quote, where uncertainty is involved, economics has nothing to say. That's quite problematic, given that we deal with this every day. Frank Knight, who uh, was a contemporary of Keynes and uh, wrote probably the most famous book on uh, fundamental uncertainty, said that without uncertainty, it's doubtful that intelligent life would even exist. So how we deal with this thing is kind of fundamental. It's not, a, it's not an add-on. And we don't find the solution to this by thinking much harder on our own. We don't do it by calculations. We certainly don't do it by AI. We use another skill, and it's that other skill that we're going to talk about today, and which Michael, I'm delighted to say, is one of the world's experts in exploring and doing research into what is that skill that we have. So why, uh, why policy crisis and policy frameworks? Well, in short, <clears throat> the premise is that the background for economic analysis is changing. Policy poly crises are multiple and overlapping unforeseen events in different domains. So if we just think about the last 15 years or so, we had a global financial crisis. This is just affecting us in the UK. Global financial crisis, Great Recession, Brexit, COVID, mass QE. I mean, mass QE, nobody thought of this before. Uh, the trust budget and now an inflation shock. <clears throat> Even if you're willing to accept that you know the variance of these shocks and they repeat and you work out their distribution, we know nothing about their joint distributions. So eventually we really have to stop this game and say we're really in a world of fundamental uncertainty. Which brings us to the policy frameworks aspect. Now, to their credit, the next slide, please. The next, to their credit, the Bank of England, the court of the Bank of England seem to have recognized this. And Ben Bernanke, the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve from 2006 to 2014 has been asked to do a review of the Bank of England's forecasting uh, and decision-making process in light of heightened uncertainty. And here's a quote, the US, UK has faced a complex constellation, like really interesting language um, of shocks. The review should consider the appropriate approach to forecasting and analysis and support of decision-making and communication in times of high uncertainty from big shocks and structural change. In other words, they recognize the game's changing. Now, constellation is a really weird word, and I didn't quite know what that meant. So I looked it up. Constellation are patterns of stars. They're like the zodiac stars, you know, like, you know, uh, Gemini and all that sort of thing. There's 88 constellations that we know about which sounds quite good until you realize there's over 200 billion trillion stars out there, which means actually our knowledge about constellations seems to be pretty low. So I think that the time has come from policymakers realizing we can no longer just deal with a world of small shocks with the structure and change that we understand. We're now moving to the world that we feel much comfortable in, which is how do we in fact deal with this uncertainty? And this is where our speakers are going to help us out. Our first speaker, is Michael, uh, a professor of economic psychology at LSE, and really doing much of the cutting edge research on the question we're asking. He's author of this famous book, A Theory of Everyone, Who We Are, How We Got Here, and Where We're Going. And I'd challenge anyone to read this book and not learn something profound that they didn't know before. Michael's gonna speak for about 30 minutes and then we get the um, pleasure of asking some questions afterwards. So Michael, the floor is yours. This is an untested talk, and it's both a good thing and a bad thing. If I run out of time, I put the less important stuff toward the end. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'll see how far I get. So the problem that I work on is human evolution. Um, how is it that humans came to be such a different animal, right? Uh, us and our livestock and our pets represent something like 98% of all the mammalian biomass on the planet. We live in every available ecosystem. And we did that long before we discovered agriculture. We did that long before uh, we discovered science. And we did it often without really understanding. And that is, is both amazing and, and it demands an explanation. And uh, the research into this kind of really emerged or a real breakthrough emerged uh, in, in the 1980s, where we began to extend the models of population genetics 
into the social world. So we ask the question of these models, under what conditions will an animal begin to rely on what other animals are doing? When will it begin to rely on social information? And it turned out the model suggested that uh, this would happen when the environment was kind of moderately stable. We call this a Goldilocks zone. If the environment is very stable, then genes are the best way to adapt. So human skin color is well adapted to latitude. Uh, you're trying to optimize not too much sunlight so you get skin cancer. If you're a fair-skinned Australian, make sure you're putting on sunscreen. And if you're dark-skinned European, make sure you're taking vitamin D tablets. Mm. If the environment is highly unstable, right, then individual learning is the only way to do it. The water is here, the water is there. Today, red berries are here. Now you got to figure out if the blueberries are edible. Individual trial and error learning. But in between these two zones is this area where it's worth paying attention to what other animals, uh, what other members of your species are doing. And it's worth paying attention to older members of the species because there's a cycle. So imagine like a cyclical drought. You've never experienced it. Maybe even your mom and dad haven't, but grandma remembers that, yes, there was a drought when she was a child. And through trial and error, uh, they went past the, mar the forest, you know, left of the mountains, and they found some water. And so she leads the tribe to safety. So there's this gold zone. So. Then around the late 90s, early 2000s, we had ice core data. And this was very exciting because it turned out that when humans emerged and when culture really took off, was this optimal zone, was this Goldilocks zone. And that people got really excited. So the field really burst into, into existence around the early 2000s. This realization was not just that humans are the product of millions of years of genetic evolution and a short lifetime of experience where we tune things, but thousands of years of cultural evolution. So we are the product of impressive hardware, but also software. So things that we acquire, beliefs, values, tools, technologies, ways of modeling the world, assumptions behind our models, all of these we acquire from previous generations, but often without really understanding, we do it in a way that meets the criteria for an evolutionary system. So three ingredients of an evolutionary system has got to be diversity, plenty of that. People do all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons. But there's also transmission and selection. So we copy one another without really understanding, and we do it selectively. So this area of research is called dual inheritance theory or the extended evolutionary synthesis, cultural evolution. And you know, in this book, uh, I think very modestly, I, I, I termed it a theory of everyone, uh, which is a play on a theory of everything in physics, this grand unifying theory. And the reason that I did that is because I think, you know, it allows us to integrate across the human social sciences. So it's not working. Okay. So, you know, obviously grounded in biology, but also, you know, economics, anthropology, psychology, engineering, and other disciplines. And, you know, for the purposes of this talk, it also allows us to think about things like climate change and new. So we can think about it in terms of our learning feedback loops, reinforcement learning across these three mechanisms by which we acquire information, genes, culture, and individual experience. And in this case, the lags and delays, for those of you who know, let's say, control theory or reinforcement learning, are too long. That's why we can't learn. We can't learn on this, right? Uh, economic stagnation. So what is the link between what we have achieved in terms of economic growth uh, and, and what these models uh, tell us about how humans have achieved anything in terms of innovation? Uh, polarization to when do societies come apart? When do they come together? So when does us become them? And when does them become us? Uh, state capacity. So how is it that we've risen up? We have these leviathans. We, we do something very unusual, right? What we're doing right now is incredible. The fact that um, strangers can sit in a room together, or you know, I, I took the tube here, sit in a tube together, is crazy. And you might take that for granted, but if this was a room full of chimps, this would be a room full of dead or maimed chimps, right? So it's weird from a cross species perspective. It's weird from a historical perspective. 200 years ago, we're all from different places. This would seem odd, it would be a dangerous thing to do. And even geographically, in some places, uh, it's still kind of a dangerous thing to do. So how did that happen? And of course, conflict between groups, which is, I would say, the flip side of cooperation. When we cooperate, we cooperate towards our greatest achievements and, of course, also our worst atrocities. So I guess the claim that I'm making is that, you know, what we call dual inheritance theory, the fact that we acquire genetic information, instincts, if you like, from our parents, uh, as well as beliefs, values, food, traditions, technologies, uh, literacy, mathematics, entire ways of thinking that we take for granted from our societies is really what makes us human and is really what makes us a different kind of animal. I've only got 30 minutes, but I'll give you one example of numeracy. Everyone in this room can count, right? Our ancestors counted like this in some small scale societies still do. One, two, three, many. 
Once you have a number system and you apply that, you map it back to something like fingers or stones, you can count anything. But even after that, it took us centuries to get to the concept of zero. And really teaching something like negative numbers, so there's a quote in this book from Francis Mazarese, who's a Canadian British mathematician, he says, negative numbers darken the very fabric of reality. It's a little melodramatic, 17th, 18th century. And it was really when we moved from objects as our mental metaphor toward a number line, that negative numbers and the concept of zero was easy enough to teach the children. If P then Q reasoning, so even reason, right? Uh, where it snows, the bears are white. In Nevaeh Zimlia, it snows. What color are the bears? Everyone thought white. When uh, Alexander Lurie, the psychologist in the 1920s, went to Uzbekistan and asked people without education that question, they said things like this. Brown, I've seen brown bear ones, <laughs> right? We did the same thing in Namibia uh, at the border. We have a, a, a natural experiment at the border. I can tell you more about it in question time if you want. We find the same thing. I have a boat from another country. In this other country, boats are made of sand. What, what are the boats made of? Wait. Could it be made out of sand? People laugh at you. There's a kind of cultural grounded reasoning that humans typically use, but of course we can overcome it. We can acquire entire new skills, not in the hardware, but in the software. So if you're only looking at the hardware, you're, you're missing a lot. When we get, in my view, a, a kind of breakthrough like this, it really represents a step change in a science. It's when a science grows up and really becomes a science, right? Um, for example, uh, the Ptolemaic model of the world, right? You can have a body that the Earth is in the center and everything rotates around the Earth, including the sun, and it's highly predictive. But you need to do things to do it, to make it predictive. For example, you have to get all the planets to do little epicycles, these little extra cycles around it. It still works. But it's not really the insight, right? It, it's not the key model. Uh, when we move further, we go to, let's say, the Copernican model. Like Copernicus's model actually also has these heavy cycles. He put the sun in the center, but he was wedded to the idea that God likes circles. <laughs> and so he still had to do it. And really, it wasn't until we got to, uh, to Kepler where we had the two key insights we needed, and everything followed from there. The two key insights is the sun's got to be in the center, and the orbits are elliptical. And now we have a full-blown science uh, of orbital mechanics. Now, Newton, not a dumb guy, right? And he's trying to turn lead into gold. Why? He doesn't understand that the world is made out of elements. You can't turn one element into another without, I don't know, a hadron collider or a sun or something, right? A star. The moment when you realize the world is made of elements is this step change, and everything flows from that. Alchemy turns into chemistry. And so the argument that I'm making is that the realization that a lot of what makes us human is in our software and in our social relationships. And the fact that you can extend these models from biology into the social realm and get really quite predictive uh, uh, models of how we learn, you know, like a sigmoidal relationship for conformist transmission. We would have never predicted that if, it, if the models hadn't suggested it. It's truly a step change. It is the beginning of a theory of human behavior, general theory of human behavior. Like if you bear with me a theory of everyone, if you like. Okay. I want to say one more thing, just because I, I mentioned when I was talking to, uh, oops, sorry, I wanted to go backwards. Okay, I can't. Um, is it, you know, in, in biology, I don't know if there are any other biologists in the room. Okay. So, you know, in biology, our, our baseline models are called Hardy-Weinberg models, and they are models of evolution without selection, just transmission over generation. That's what I sometimes think about kind of baseline economic models as, right? It's like you have to first just, you know, the Earth is in the center, we just assume that the orbits are circular, and then you have to fix it. You got to put a bunch of things in to fix it, but you might be able to get a more elegant model if you have the right set of assumptions. <laughs> oh, okay. So anyway, so that's what I think um, dual inheritance theory represents. So in the book, uh, you know, I wrote this book a little bit out of frustration. I, I wanted to find a way to write and explain this in a way that would be accessible to anybody. I, Skip the math, skip a bunch of graphs. Don't believe me because five studies said so. I don't know if you've heard of the replication price. Don't believe anything because five studies said so, right? Don't believe it if a hundred studies said so. Believe it because you can check it against your own life, right? And so I distilled this into four laws of life. They're not Newtonian laws. They're more like lenses to view the world. You can take those seriously as one, but they are, I would say, the key lenses that you need to understand just about everything. They are the laws of energy, the law of innovation, the law of cooperation, and the law of evolution. And I'm going to start here with the, the law of, uh, I'll get to my speaker notes anymore. Is that possible? It's okay, fine, I'll, I'll end with it. Uh, I'm going to start with the law of cooperation because that's actually how I started thinking about this problem. Um, and of course, this is one of the areas that I work on. 
you may have seen graphs like this before. I, I, I think many of you have, right? This is a graph. You could put almost anything you want. You can see these are obviously scaled, so don't worry about the y-axis. We're just looking at the pattern. Life expectancy, any any thing about human progress, GDP per capita, percentage not living in extreme poverty, energy capture, war making capacity, percentage living in democracy, state, whatever you want, right? And the world looks like this. All of those events that you learn about in school, you know, they make the advantage of the fall of the Roman Empire, the Black Death, which killed 30 to 40 percent of Europe, right? Genghis Khan, uh, you know, the Renaissance, the, the scientific revolution in London, these are blips. They're wiggles. They're nothing on this graph, right? All of these major world events are nothing. And then we hit the Industrial Revolution, and absolutely everything just shoots up into, including our, our, our ability to cooperate with one another. How did that happen? I think the answer actually emerges from this kind of first principles, you know, what does it take to turn a chimp like a, a last common ancestor in, into a human? So in, in, in 2005, Science Magazine actually laid out its 125 big questions for the coming quarter century. In the top 25 was this question of, human, of cooperation. How is it that cooperation evolves? Uh, a couple of years ago, Joe Henrik and I uh, wrote a review paper where we summarized the state of the field. And I'm kind of going to give you the, the cliff notes if you like the summary. And that is that we actually understand cooperation really well. Now, don't get me wrong, whenever I write a paper about this, I'm like, cooperation is a puzzle that is of interest to biologists, psychologists, economists, and everyone else. So incredibly important, you should publish it in nature. Um, it's not really true. We kind of understand the mechanisms at this point, and they are as follows, right? Um, the reason, like, you know, if you've ever been to a talk, they're like, love is a mystery. Who could know why we love our families? We know why we love our families. It's inclusive fitness or kin selection. Genes that can identify and favor copies of themselves, at least under weak selection, will spread the expense of genes that don't. When a lion comes in and sees someone else's cubs, it'll kill those cubs and replace them with its own. It won't kill its own cubs. When we cooperate, we often cooperate with our family. And we've done this. We used to be bands of related individuals marching across the globe. But that gets you to the level of people who know each other, right? You can go a little further with direct reciprocity, uh, peer punishment, reciprocal altruism, follow what you want. You scratch my back, I scratch yours, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You help me, I help you. Easy. Again, that is limited. So, you know, I don't know if you like your colleagues, but you'll cooperate with them because you're going to see them again, right? That's for how this works. You can go a little further uh, through indirect reciprocity or reputation, gossip, norms, whatever you like. The idea is that I don't know who you are. I've heard of Agnes. Dave So Wilson said he was a great guy. And because of that reputation, I can conditionally cooperate with somebody. And that gets you to the level of people you know of. You don't necessarily know directly, but you know of. And that's enough to get this off the ground. Now, religion and supernatural punishment have been suggested as a mechanism to get us to, well, we all love institutions, the institutional punishment, the Leviathan, right? The idea being that um, if somebody has a religious marker, it's like an ethnic marker, wearing a cross, wearing a hijab, whatever the case may be, and you belong to that religion, you are slightly more likely to trust them because of two things. One, they have the marker, and you know that the marker is being managed by the community, and you know what the community believes. So if I'm a co-religionist, I know you're likely to not screw me over because you believe in the supernatural God. And that is a proto-institution, an informal institution. I'm going to use the language of cultural evolution. I know if we're, you know, if, I know, so economists are talking about institutions as this stuff and everything else is culture. The whole thing is culture from my perspective. Um, preferences, norms, and hardened norms when we write them down into legal codes and constitutions. And connected norms are informal institutions, and when you write them down, they're formal institutions. That's what I mean. But of course, we also know that institutions have their limits. They're very difficult to transport. We tried to bring it to Afghanistan. They didn't really like it. it. Didn't work out well, right? In Iraq, similar story. If you think that institutions do all the work, you might wonder why something like Liberia borrowed all the institutions from the United States, arguably a good experiment, maybe right up to the 21st century. Uh, and you might wonder why it didn't take off, right? Can't just be institutions. So actually, the remaining puzzles are not so much what are the mechanisms. They are how is it that humans for, for humans cooperation, that is, how is it that humans vary so dramatically in scale and intensity of cooperation? How is it that some among us cooperate at the scale of a billion people in a country or nations of nations like the United States and the European Union? And others cooperate at the scale of regions, bands, tribes, related individuals. Why are there massive domain differences? If you look at uh, the anthropological records, some groups cooperate only on house building but not fishing, others only on fishing and not house building. 
even among countries. Some cooperate for the military, but not healthcare. Others for healthcare and, you know, don't always pay their military. Rapid expansion. Remember that graph? How did that happen? That's not genes. How did you, how did we ramp up cooperation so quickly? And how, and why is it that the same mechanisms that I described, for example, norms <laughs> and reputation are also able to sustain non-cooperative and maladaptive behavior in the models and in the real world. Foot binding, uh, female genital cutting, for example, also maintained by those same mechanisms. So the answer is really what undermines, well, the question you might ask is what undermines cooperation? And the answer is actually uh, cooperation. Cooperation undermines cooperation. So some of my work is on corruption. Um, you can read some experimental work uh, uh, that I wrote with Patrick Francois uh, and, and Joe Henrik, uh, as well as a summary of that in, in Pro Market. The idea is basically that what corrupt, corruption is not a mystery. Corruption is easy to explain. It is natural. It is the baseline. It is what humans have always done. The mystery is how we ever overcame it. Because when we, when a, uh, a president gives his son a contract, we call that nepotism. It's inclusive fitness, undermining our institutions. It's, you know, uh, if a manager gives a job to a friend or a friend of a friend, right? It's cronyism, but it's also direct or indirect reciprocity undermining uh, our meritocracy, for example. So again, this gives you a framework, a principal framework for thinking about this problem where you're not just inductively saying, let me just look at the data and I'm gonna make entirely data-driven RCT decisions, but I have, a, I have a, an overarching theoretical framework. And one marker of an overarching theoretical framework is you start to you start to see what is sense and what is nonsense. You're able to distinguish these and you're able to it just everything comes into, into relief. So cooperation uh, so but if cooperation undermines cooperation, and we're back to this question, how do we get here? How did this happen? So I'll again, in the interest of time, I'll just quickly give you what I think my answer is, and that is that. If you look not just in humans, but you look across the biological world, cooperation, innovations, inefficiency, energy, and the evolutionary process, those four laws, all go hand in hand. The story of early life was the use initially early life only had the you know gravitational energy of the moon, which was closer to us with massive tides, swinging things over the land and sloshing them back to the ocean. But eventually you get proto-photosynthesis. You're using the energy of the sun, and it creates a limit on the biomass available for all of life. Eventually, there are innovation breakthroughs. You know, the uh, the rovers of the of the single cell life world go, hey, if we use oxygen in this process, we can actually do more, and life flourishes. But eventually, evolution is always looking for ways to do more with less. There is this kind of innovation in, in innovations and efficiency, and so some life forms go, huh, wait a minute, I don't want to use the sun and move at plant pace. What I'm going to do is eat you. I'm going to, so at some point, eukaryotic life was born. That is one organism ate another. And instead of digesting it for its constituent parts, it let it live. And that it was our ancestor, mitochondria evolved, ATP. So we were, in other words, able to store that energy. Because the thing is, if you get energy and you can't store it, it's like solar and wind. That's the problem that early life faced. But once you can store it in the form of sugars, then you're a nice tempting target. And you can eat those. And so that is that is the story of early life. And you get this continual uptake as long as the ceiling on energy is there. So the limit on the biomass of, uh, of predators is the limit on the biomass of prey, which is the limit on the biomass of plants. There was a, uh, an asteroid that came from my herds five million years ago, dropped the whole thing, right? Blocked out the sun, dropped the whole thing. All of those big animals died off, couldn't do it. Yeah. So there's a limit. So what I basically try to say is there is a space of the possible, if you'd like, an energy ceiling governed by how much is available to us, uh, an efficiency floor, how well you can use that with some limit to how efficient you can be. Look at the history of lighting, for example, LEDs approach 100% efficiency. If you've heard the thing, turn off the lights to save the environment, stop doing it. It's a waste of time. Take one flight and it's all over. We're not using a lot of energy at all. And that's the space of that. Now, for when we found millions of years worth of stored sunlight in the ground, right? Those fossil fuel batteries. So uh, zooplankton, right? And algae turned to, uh, turned to oil and natural gas, pressure cooked into oil and natural gas. 
and uh, peat turned to black rock that we call coal. We found millions of years worth of stored sunlight and we burned and we learned how to put it to use. Energy is the great multiplier on human effort. And it also incentivizes us to cooperate with one another because we can do more with it. On the back of cheap and available coal, this country built the largest empire the world had ever seen. And the reason that we're all speaking English, even if we went in Asia. And then what you do, it's a similar story to early life. So just as those early eukaryotic organisms work together in complex eukaryotic organisms to go and eat all those other animals, you get the story of colonialization, where sophisticated uh, civilizations were outcompeted by this tiny backwater of the Roman Empire, who now found a lot of energy and was able to build something out of that and cooperate at an unprecedented scale. Oh. So anyway, so these are the, the four laws of the matter. This is, this is only, you know, often, especially mainstream economics, we don't worry about that input to the system because for most of, of economics history, it never mattered. The ceiling was so high that, you know, if you think about a regression, what's the main predictor? The one that's, you know, it's the, it's the reactive, it's the one that's limited, and that is efficiency, right? It's about human capital, so learning more stuff, the technology of our minds, the technology in our actual products, and using this stuff more efficiently, don't worry about that energy ceiling. It didn't matter for most of, most of history. It was just about doing things more efficiently. There was plenty to go around. But the economy isn't a perpetual motion machine. It looks more like an ecosystem. And even the simplest ecosystem models that we show the children always have an input, right? You always have that limit. You have that energy ceiling, if you like. You might also want to model, you know, uh, some of the... Uh, the matter that's coming out of it too, maybe. Even. By the way, I should say that you know there there is work within economics. There's an entire field of energy economics that does this. Uh, Steve Bean, for example, uh, you know has some nice models right here. Uh, this is not an ignored thing, but I would say within the mainstream, this. And so I think the an economic model that is grounded in the, in biophysical realities looks a bit more like this, which I took from Charles Hall, the guy who came up with this concept of energy return on investment, how much energy it takes to get some amount of energy back. You know, it considers where those energy sources come from. It considers the fact that there's a limit to our stored energy capacity, and we are starting to hit that. It's starting to matter more. And then we've got our economic machine, and then you might want to think about those negative externalities, like the waste that destroying the planet and all of that business. So the reason that it's starting to matter a lot more, wow, slides. Okay, so it started to matter a lot more. Uh, we can see it in the empirical data. So even if it didn't, if it didn't seem obvious, so like I said, I'm coming out of this from a completely different place. I'm interested in cooperation and human evolution, and it happens to be that energy is important there. But I think it also starts to intersect with uh, with economics. So economist Henry Adams just noticed that. Uh, so you know this is back in, in the 1800s. Uh, he noticed that um, energy consumption and, and GDP growth. Were, were, were well aligned with one another. And then we kind of fell off the Henry Adams curve. So you can fit in, uh, an expert. This is kind of Moore's law to this. And that Moore's law ended around 1970. What happened in 1970? A few things happened around the you know, 1970s. The first was that the US hit kind of its, its peak oil. So it started to have to become a, 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 an importer of Middle Eastern oil. Um, we had Nixon shock. That may or may not have mattered. The end of Bretton Woods and, and, and going off the gold standard. The fact that money became detached from uh, from any physical reality may or may not have mattered, but the OPEC oil crisis. So you had the uh, uh, the war in the Middle East and, and the OPEC nations came together and they're like, we're going to restrict the supply. Eventually we didn't have, it wasn't the end of oil, we still have plenty, it was the end of cheap oil. And the world changed. There's a website called uh, WTF happened in 1971. I encourage you to look at it, graph after graph after graph after graph of this divergence that takes place, that takes place exactly the moment you might have expected it to. And actually, if you look at the, this is the same graph, by the way, um, this I took out of uh, a book called, you know, where, the, where, where are our flying cars or something like that. Uh, you can actually fit different exponential functions to this that map on very nicely to the available energy source at the time. The first exponential function was really about coal until that became, uh, coal mines started to fail uh, towards the, the beginning of the, of the last century. Uh, if you look at the yellow exponential growth curve, that is primarily oil and natural gas and a little bit of nuclear. And the aggregate is what I was showing you before. And then, of course, we fell off here. We had a, a stillborn nuclear age. We didn't get that era of energy abundance. I, I should say, by the way, I didn't tell you the intermediates that this is a pattern we find every single time. So when agriculture emerges, we became less healthy, we became shorter, but we were able to expand with the solar technology. 
the energy return on investment for agriculture is a lot higher than walking around hunting and gathering. It's a reliable source of food. And so we push the hunter-gatherer groups to the margins where most of them still live today, the forests that are too thick for agriculture uh, without now machines where we can cut down the rainforest. Um, and, and deserts, for example. It's a similar pattern over and over again. And there's a, you know there's other bits of evidence. I can't see my slides, what's coming next. So one, one thing, of course, is that the energy return on investment is starting to plummet. So this is oil discovery rates. Energy return on investment, by the way, I talk about it a lot in the book, but it's notoriously difficult to calculate. I just think it's an intuitive way to think about this. How much energy does it take to get some amount of energy back? When an animal is going to hunt another animal, if the cheetah expends more energy to catch the prey than the prey provides it in calories, that cheetah is going to die. If there's not enough for the group, some amount of members of that group are going to die. For humans, we haven't had to worry about the ceiling because the energy return on, let's say, oil and gas was so high for so long. In 1910 or 19, you know, it's, I don't know, what, early 1900s, it was about one to a thousand. Every one barrel of oil found you another thousand. By 1950, that had fallen to about 50 to 60. And by 2010, it had fallen to about five. We didn't get that replacement technology that we got when coal happened. We, did, we had that stillborn age, if you like, of, of, of the nuclear revolution. This appears around Three Mile Island, which you know, um, Now, you know, so the, the correlation between energy usage and, um, uh, or oil, you want to be more specific, and, and for GDP uh, per capita is, is somewhere, or, or any of these things, actually, somewhere around 0.7, 0.8, so around there. So if you want to take, you know, the square that, it's about, like, let's say 50%. Is to do with our energy, but of course, efficiency matters too. So, we've had two things we've had kind of a stagnation in efficiency, so the ceiling is the, or the floor is starting to slow down in terms of that, and the energy ceiling has come down. And also, with that space as a possible is shrinking. So, what does it incentivize? It incentivizes lower levels of cooperation because even something like innovation is not an individual act, it is not the case that there were who invented calculus. Who was it? Not a trick question. No, no. I mean, you see how <laughs> two people. That's right. Newton and Leibniz. Right. This is a common pattern. Who, who came up with evolution? Charles Darwin. Also, Alfred Wallace. Right. Like algebra, I think it's algorithm. So I said again. Algorithm. Who came up with? Uh, uh, algorithms. Algorithms. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, the uh, the Islamic uh, golden age. We get algebra, algorithms, a lot of al things because that's where it all came from, right? But um. But the, this is, it's a weird thing. We are always, as scientists, we are convinced of our own genius, but also afraid of being scooped. That's weird. Why? What? We see further than other people, but other people might see the same thing. Weird. But it is the case that simultaneous invention is, is commonplace. And that is because innovation is better seen from the perspective of the people inherent this theory as a collective act. It is ideas flowing around our social networks, recombining a software in people's heads and Newton and Leibniz are reading similar material. It's not everybody who came up with it, but the people reading that similar material come up with these brand new ideas. They have these new tools, new ways of thinking about it. So, you know, uh, this we have a series of papers that kind of go into this, but really you can then derive things like, well, what are the levers of innovation? The sociality, the size and interconnectedness of populations, the, the ability to transmit that through education, through mass media, whatever, and our tolerance for diversity, which is a double-edged sword, by the way. So diversity is divisive, so it cuts off ideas from flowing, but also it's fuel for innovation. So it's the duality of it. Uh, you didn't talk about that, but I want to keep going. How am I doing on time, by the way? Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left, and then we'll take 10, yeah, five minutes on the break. So 10 oh, minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So in the second half of the book, so in the first half of the book, I feel pretty, I feel pretty hot, but all I'm really doing is trying to convey the science in a way that is accessible as possible. In part two of the book, I go off the deep end. No. I, in part two of the book, what I try to do is say, okay, well, take it for granted that I'm, I'm offering you, a, like this, I'm gonna describe it. It's not me, I didn't come up with this. If anyone presents you a theory of everyone says they came up with it, be suspicious. I'm just describing what's in the field. Um, part two of the book, I said, well, we'll take this seriously. If you're the first person to see the periodic table and you wanna move from alchemy to chemistry, what does that mean for many of the problems that we face? What are the things that we should be betting on? Because some things are gunpowder. Before the periodic table, we knew how to make things explode. And some things are alchemy, turning lead into gold. Some things are animal and plant breeding, right? We turned a magnificent wolf into a poodle. We know how to do that. And some things are not. Some things are just, you know, made up stuff. So one thing is if innovation is this collective process, 
then we never really invented any of our institutions. We're terrible designers. What we are seeing is the product of an evolutionary process where we tried a bunch of stuff. And the ones that succeeded, the ones that actually worked, are the ones that stuck around. You can see this in the history of religion, by the way. People have often said, how come religions have these common things about being nice to your family, not lying to people, looking after others? What is that? Do they just all, are we arriving at the truth? Well, every major world religion today is a major world religion because it has grown thanks to those set of beliefs. It's not that there weren't other religions, right? There are other religions like uh, the Shakers. Anyone heard of the Shakers? Mm -hmm. What were the, who were the Shakers? They, they were an American uh, Protestant group in the early 19th century. They came up with they made beautiful music on keeping the facilities. Correct, yeah. So they were quite, they were an offshoot of the Quakers, in fact, who believed in celibacy, not for a priestly class, but for everyone. There are no Shakers. <laughs> <laughs> So you see, we try different things, right? And this is also true of our, you know, like when when uh, when George Washington was, you know, um, pushing for this new state and, and fighting against the, the motherland. Um, people like he's trying to declare himself King George. He's like, no, no, we're going to try something different, built, built on this, you know, this philosophy. That might have been a complete failure. And if it was, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have gone down that path. Instead, we have a proliferation of constitutions built around the U.S. Constitution. It was it was easier, I think, for Frank Obiaba to write the end of history when you know communism had just fallen, everything was great, and it's a little bit harder, I think, for him to written the same book, in, you know, with the rise of China. And we go back and forth. We're like watching. Is that really a new model? Will that work? We don't design these things; they evolve. And so, if that is the case, what you want to do is design an environment where evolution is 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 efficient. And we can see this over and over again. So, Justice Brandeis described the United States as laboratories. Each state tries it. Why the principle is fail locally, learn globally. The uh, Microsoft did this, and when Nadella came in, what he did was he turned it into a series, an ecosystem of startups. It's the reason Silicon Valley works so well. Silicon Valley is not a, uh, it's not a bastion of success. I mean, it is, but it's also a graveyard of failure. For every, every large unicorn, we call them unicorns because they're so rare. For every one of them, there is many, many that you've long forgotten. So how do we take that to the world of policymaking? Well, what we do is around 2007, more people were living in urban environments than rural. That's when humanity crossed the, the Rubicon, if you like, right? This is when we became a city-dwelling species. Cities, unlike countries, are quite successful for the most part. If you develop power using charter cities or startup cities, you teach cities to learn from one another, you can get the advantage, you can try different things. I'm a, I'm a fellow at the Charter Cities Institute, where we're trying to do this in Africa, bypass corrupt institutions by giving off a piece of land. You know, many of you probably know this is like Romer's idea of uh, Hong Kong was an engine of development for China. Why? If, in, in our cultural distance metrics, it is 50% British culturally, 50% Chinese, source of its problems. But when it was handed back, China was like, that's a really good idea. Let's do Shenzhen and Guangzhou. Let's do that over and over again. Let's even try it around the world. I don't think China should be the only country trying to do that. I think we should be trying that all around the world. And I think it's a, we might one day take that for granted. A way to test policy is to just try and build new cities with new approaches with learning. So we learn how these ecosystems work. Economic growth and zero sum. There's some nice work by uh, Jean-Paul Cavallo uh, uh, over at Oxford. Nathan Nunn is on that paper as well. Okay, might be on that paper where he shows that zero sum beliefs. So one of the things about cooperation is the law of cooperation actually states, as I say it, is that it's so obvious I don't even have to say it, but the level of cooperation that we should expect is the level at which my returns from whatever I win through that cooperation, when divided up by the number of cooperators, ought to be higher than what I would get in a larger or smaller group in expectation. Obviously, you, can't, you don't know. That is the optimal size of a company. That's the optimal. Like, if I was a physicist, I would rather write one paper all by myself on large hadron colliders and win a Nobel Prize, but I got to work with thousands. If I'm an economist, I try to stick to three because that's the limit on Nobel Prizes. You know? But if I go a little further, I, it's only because I have to. So when the economy slows down, our zero-sum mindset is triggered. I go from a world where I believe that your win is my, by the way, it doesn't have to be real. You can have a psychological trap. I believe that your win is my loss and vice versa. And it's a totally different kind of psychology in terms of cooperation. When I believe that the world is positive side and you create a coffee shop, I'm like, oh, Starbucks are moving. I got to start my own. If I believe that the market is restricted and, and its growth is slowed down, I'm like, he's taking a piece of the pie that I can never get back. So I have to hurt you. 
do that. And many countries are trapped in that situation. And sometimes it's real, sometimes it's not. This is also true of models of multiculturalism. I think that we need to have an adult conversation about diversity. <laughs> Right? Diversity is the fuel, it is the secret. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Singapore, has this wonderful quote about uh, the, uh, America where he says, uh, a billion Han nationalist Chinese can never compete with the United States, even though they are a smaller population, because they can draw on the world's 7 billion people at the time uh, and, and richly move them into something new, the melting pot, a brand new population working together for the great end. You can never compete with that. But other models, you know, I think you can you can predict. That. I think personally that the mosaic model of Canada, where communities live in separation, is a fragile model because a mosaic is less sturdy than a single pane of glass when put under pressure. It would be my prediction. Uh, the no hyphen French model could work if you weren't forcing people to assimilate. You actually had people who wanted to. And, you know, the brutal history of French colonialism gets in the way. Um, and I suggested an umbrella model. Uh, you can read about it in the book, is a better model that takes into consideration resources and thinks about immigration as a hiring process where you're looking for the best candidates to fill positions. When you bring people into a company, if you want to build a great organization, it's kind of like building a great company. You want to bring in people who have, who would need it for particular jobs. You need to make sure that they have enough spaces for houses, spaces for uh, hospitals and so on. Otherwise, uh, you create pressure and you trigger zero sum conditions. And then I go really far outside, you know, sufficiently far outside my area, and I'd love to hear what you think about this. But, you know, I, I suggest that there are things that get in the way. Money is a lean on energy, as Charles Hall puts it. But it's also, it's a share of the economy. It's your voting share on how we allocate our energy budget. And what we want in terms of that money is to give it to the people who expand the spaces of possible as much as possible. And so then you have issues with, well, some kinds of wealth, wealth is not a problem, inequality is a problem, but some kinds of wealth are wealth creation because they expand the space as possible through innovations and efficiency, and some are just appropriation, it's rent seeking, sometimes on literal rent. And, and for that reason, I end up suggesting that land value taxes are a, a good way forward because they're not distortionary, and I don't think I need to, to make that case here. Compared to things like income tax, sales tax, which by the way only emerged in you know in 1907 in the United States, where they started charging income tax very, very recent, it was one percent, right? Seven percent if you're making over, I think, uh 10 million or 500 million in today's money, right? And then it just kept going up, and eventually the burden was placed on the middle class. We don't we can go back. The world was made by people no smarter than the people in this room, and you don't have to accept it the way it is. Is one of the stories for uh of cultural revolution. Oh. Uh, we can think about our education system. So what is education? It is not a general thing that just makes us more open-minded. It is a specific cultural download. It emerged, you know, compulsory formal education emerges with the Industrial Revolution. We need factory workers with a different skill set. We're like, sit down, kids. We are going to download a bunch of different phonemes, numbers, you know, letters, algebra, calculus. On we go, on we go, on we go. And of course, we're hitting a new so we're, we're hitting a new problem in that the world has become more complex. So it takes longer and longer to download that information. So we spend longer and longer teaching it. The you used to be a high school job was enough that it was math, uh, you know, any university degree, then STEM, then master, then unpaid internships, and on uh, to the point where we're hitting a new limit, which is the ability to reproduce at an older age. Biologically, the, the first limit was how do you give birth to a big brain? Uh, we're unique in, in how painful and dangerous that is. But there are ways for it. If we look at, you know, I was in Estonia uh, a few months back uh, because how did Estonia climb to the top of the PISA tables? Their students outperform the rest of the Western world in math, in reading, and science. They integrated technology into the curriculum. They have the highest number of unicorn companies per capita. I can say more about that if you really like. But again, it follows from this idea that we are a product of hardware and software, and it is the software that has been evolving over time and has led to the Flynn effect where we are getting smarter. And then there's low hanging fruit, like in, in my field of behavioral science interventions, integrating culture and, and that heterogeneity is just, it's just obvious that we ought to be doing it and there's, there's easy ways to do it. So long story short, I think, you know, there's, there's many things to be answered. There's many holes in the periodic table, if you'd like, but I think we have the right insight now. We know the sun is in the center. We know the dimension of people orbits. The rest follows. There's work to be done, but it's, it's, it's massive. Here we go. Michael, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, I'm sure there's some questions 
from the audience. Can I just ask a clarification question yeah. about energy? And are you seeing that law of energy as a constraint on our future development, or do we have to move away from uh, uh, units of energy per um, dollar of GDP? Or what? What is the link between that so, and extended so cooperation? Mean, GDP or mm -hmm. money is just an invented thing that makes you know makes price finding useful. And by the way, that's also a reason that inequality is a problem. Like you, you know, it's extraordinary. Uh, no, I see there's a fundamental limit on growth, and so I, I, I so there's two paths ahead of us. So one, we say we need sustainability. But there's a problem with that in that if your theory violates some fundamental rule about evolution or human nature or something in there, it's a bad theory. So, you know, communism, for example, uh, E.O. Wilson, who studied ants, yeah. you know, he once said, great, great idea, wrong species. Works well for ants. Yeah. Uh, so for, for us, I think the problem we can we can either stagnate because we are hitting this fundamental limit on fossil fuels or we get the next era of abundance and we use that era of abundance to clean up the mess we created. It's many, you know, many of the countries that are uh, that are most efficient and want to keep places clean are actually the developed countries, right? So of course we use more and, and we are damaging the environment. But you know, if you're Australia, you have lots of money, you can go try to clean up the Great Barrier Reef. You have that excess energy in your budget, so that's what I see. So I mean, you know, again, this is a problem for energy. Uh, solar, we're going to be using Wonderful. Okay, uh, questions. Uh, Alan, and then we've got Damon. Yeah, the, uh, yeah fascinating. I enjoyed it a lot. But yeah, there's a paradox somehow. Uh, we've been obsessed for many, many years with efficiency, optimization, and so forth. And we attribute that to species other than us. So we hear uh, uh, books and books on optimal foraging. Everything's optimal. Uh, uh, you know, just so stories, all yeah. that. So we look at the outside yeah. and we say, all oh, that's happening, but it's super efficient. But uh, that is not really the truth. Um, so, you know, you, uh, I think you said, oh, well, we're, we make progress by, we, we are more efficient than they are. But on the other hand, if you uh, talk to entomologists, Deborah Gordon, Stanford, yeah, great stuff. he yeah. said, yeah. look, I, I've been studying ants all my life. And if you tell me that they're optimal, I can say, tell you that kneeling in front of ants nests for weeks and weeks on end, you just want to help them. <laughs> they're just doing such a lousy job. On the other hand, they get the job done. So there's something more going on. It's not, yeah. uh, I think people tend to reduce this to yeah. say, so all yeah. the species manage to optimize somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the answer to that is that when selection is very high, we, we start to see overly optimal behavior. But actually what you want is the, what we call the evolvability. So that is you tolerate some degree of non-optimization because that's what you need if the environment changes. So if all of the nuts look like this and all the birds' beaks are exactly right, if the nuts change, that species goes extinct. So you need to tolerate some amount of diversity. It's a, it's a second order optimization problem that's actually going on. So across the animal kingdom, that's where we find like bird flights go crazy at first and then they over time optimize. But if that pathway is going to knock them into an airplane, it's good that not all of them are perfectly optimal. So I, I don't think that that's not baked in, actually. In, in a lot of the work, we talk about diversity and the role that they link between diversity and innovation. And within biology as a, as a mainstream, the idea of evolvability, I think it's it's baked in. Yeah. Okay. Darwin, Darwin, you get brilliant if you're over optimized. Darwin did recognize that yeah. adaptability is hugely yeah. important. Yeah. So not just adaptation, but adaptability. Exactly. Damon. Space attachments are problem in the past. Um, the macroeconomics, macroeconomics, was some subjects that, that were uh, value maximized because that was something that were value for our way. It looks, it seems to that it has that assumption in the first time. I tell you, the angles are possible for something about that. You appear to be implicitly critiquing that at some point. And I'm, and I'm wondering if you might be more explicit about what you think the implication of your work is yeah. those assumptions and for what yeah. flows from those assumptions. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, actually, in this paper, you know, this, uh, this published in Behavioral Public Policy, and in this graph, you can kind of see it, right? The four axioms of uh, rational behavior. Uh, and then this this moment in behavioral economics where, like, actually, we have a nice theory that's making predictions, but 
it's broken in these specific ways. And if you can critique it on the right grounds, you eventually get to behavioral science, which is a, an attempt to fix that. In, in my reading of it, um, economics as a discipline has also gone through a cultural evolutionary process. And it was grounded in Western thought and it's grounded really in 19th century philosophy of this idea of man as a rational animal, which is again, a very specific cultural through our education system way of thinking about the world. And then uses effectively physics as the model for how to, how to, how to integrate this. The models look very much like, like physical models, including inflation and you know uh, efficiency and, uh, and frictions in the market, right, physics. Um, but really, what we have is a biological system. And biological systems are, uh, first off, necessarily, my brother is a physicist, and I joke that your science is easy, man. Like, your planets do exactly what you expect them to do. Humans do all kinds of things. So we have an effective theory. So this is talking about effective theory problems. Like, what's going on at the level of the gas is different to what's going on at the gas law level. So, yes, I am implicitly critiquing that the way we model this is broken. It's not a problem for me because I'm not an economist. I get to model it however I want. But again, you know, as I said, you know, economic models to me look like Hardy Weinberg models that you have to fix. And maybe there's a way to fix them in a way that integrates that, that culture. You know, one example of this. So uh, in, in my work on cooperation, we, uh, we use a public goods game. And, um, you know, I was building on some work by Ernst Fair where he just inserts uh, inequity version. It's fine. Where did that come from? And why do you think there's like inequity version? Because actually, if you look across cross culturally, symmetrical inequity version is not a thing. Everyone around the world cares when they get less. Not everybody cares when you get less, right? So you might be able to further say, like, if you want to start from that path dependent, this is where we are, so this is where we got to go. Then you have to say, okay, well, how do we bake in that evolutionary process that's tuning those preferences and the values? But then it becomes a much more complicated world. Another way is maybe this other pathway through cultural evolution emerges and converges at the same point. But I'm definitely I'm critiquing the the assumptions behind them. But it's path dependence. You know, it's like trying to change the education system or the constitution. Is that an answer, or is that do I need to be more? This is beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Fair. Yeah. Probably time. Yes. Thanks for Just a quick question. I thought you think AI experiment. Yeah, so actually, I did it, I, in the book, I, I talk about this. Um, I, I, I think of AI as the fourth line of information. So genes, culture, individual learning, and then this incredible thing we can read across our cultural corpus and help us perhaps make personalized decisions uh, and, and perhaps find things in that space of possibilities that lead to great efficiencies, massive scientific breakthroughs. There may be a limit to it, um, but I do think it's it's a massive, massive change. Uh, it's like, as I said, introducing a new reinforcement learning system on this massive, this corpus. But I dare not predict what that means and where that goes. I don't think it solves the fundamental problem of energy in part because those data centers and that compute requires tremendous amounts of energy. So, you know, in some places you have massive solar panels mapping up and Amazon just built a data center hooked up to a nuclear reactor. So that fundamental problem of energy doesn't go away. And in fact, one place that humans might end up being there is because it's less costly, calorifically costly, to get a human to do it than it is to use the machine. So it could, it might be that they are actually better, like AI is better than us at everything, but it could be where it's cheaper. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I think we're going to draw the first session to a close. Uh, can I just remind everybody that we're now going to go, um, there's tea available, coffee and tea, uh, on the third floor foyer, so two floors up. And then we're back in here for 2.30 for the second session. Uh, but before we go, can I just ask you to thank Michael once again for an outstanding presentation. Thank you. thank you very much. Uh, our second speaker this afternoon is Clara Matei, who joins us from uh, New York online here. Clara is Professor of Economics at the New School of Social Research in New York, and she explores the critical relation between economic ideas and technocratic policymaking, which again exactly speaks to this issue we're addressing today about policy cri poly crises and policy frameworks. Her book has been uh, very widely acclaimed, called The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity, and the next bit is the worrying bit, and paved the way to fascism. 
It's a salutary reminder of Keynes' famous words that the ideas of economists and political philosophers, when they're right and when they're wrong, is more powerful than is commonly understood. Now, because of demands in New York, uh, Clara is going to speak for, I think, 20 minutes and then take 10 minutes Q&A, if that's all right, um, before leaving us. But Clara, thank you very much indeed. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm very sad not to be there in person, but uh, as it is, I'm working here in New York. Before I begin, I would like to just take a moment to remind everyone that as we are uh, privileged in this room to be talking ideas, um, there's a massacre in Gaza going on and there's human suffering to levels that are really uh, unimaginable. And we have more than almost 13,000 children dead. And now one out of three children under the age of two is malnourished. And we know that starvation is being used indeed as a weapon of war. And as a mother of a, of a child of a year and a half, um, I really cannot sleep at night. So I really wanna make sure that this is in our minds also because what is happening in Gaza, just like what is happening in Sudan and Haiti are not unrelated to the problems that as political economists, we should be worried about and questioning and really understanding in order to transform the world um, in a better place. So this is in the spirit in which I actually wrote my book, The Capital Order that I have here with me. Um, it's a book that actually, um, began because um, I was quite unsatisfied with the type of public debate and academic discourse regarding austerity. Um, in the 2012s, as I was thinking about the book, we were, of course, undertaking very strong austerity waves in Europe, also in Italy under the Monti administration. And we know that unfortunately austerity has never really left us. The debate amongst the macroeconomists um, is usually centered on whether or not austerity um, works to um, resolve the debt problem and cure inflation, right? So it's about does it even, or whether it, it helps promote economic growth. So we see that we have those in favor of austerity who advocate for forms of exp for austerity as expansionary, meaning that austerity does indeed help promote economic growth. And those who instead tell us that austerity is indeed bad policy uh, born out of irrational economic theory because it never has really served the purpose of solving our debt or promoting economic growth. Um, this is why, for example, someone like Mark Blythe has called um, austerity as madness being the constant repetition of something that doesn't work. Now, you see that the debate here is um, the two opposing parts to this debate actually have much more in common than one would actually think. Indeed, they both share this concept that the economy is um, an object to be managed, and we are in search of the best tools to do so. The approach I take in my work is actually uh, different because I instead um, politicize the economy and start uh, questioning what purpose that austerity serve to reproduce capitalist accumulation. So not taking our economy for granted, but understanding that our economy is a very specific type of type of economy. It's an economy based on two specific pillars, private property of the means of production and wage relations. And that this um, type of economy is actually much more fragile uh, than one would think, given that it is not spontaneous at all, but it is actually based on capital, and that's the title of the book, The Capital Order, capital as, of course, the social relation of production by which the majority of people have no alternative but to sell their capacity to work on the labor market in return for a wage, usually a low wage. So the capital order is something that economists should really start problematizing rather than taking for granted. And if you do so, what does emerge is that you get two insights that are very important. The first one is that austerity is not at all a technical necessity, but a crucial political project. Secondly, so unlike you know, 
the technocrats in favor of expansion austerity. This is what you find out. But it is on, uh, going against the Keynesian analysis is not at all bad economic policy because it actually serves as the structural purpose of foregoing alternatives to capitalism and stabilizing those class relations that are fundamental for any economic growth under capitalism to take place in the first place. So this is a fundamental different take on austerity that thus leads us to rethink its nature, logic, and purpose. In order to do this, we also have to um, broaden the definition of austerity a bit. We are used to understanding austerity. If you read the definitions that you also find on dictionaries online or even scholarly papers, it is usually referred to as a policies, uh, a policy of budget cuts and tax increases. Now you see the problem with this definition um, is a problem that already assumes a methodological position that is very common amongst economists and that I question, which is, the view of the aggregate, the whole. This whole tells us very little about who actually wins and who loses when we apply austerity. So rather than looking at the aggregate where potentially you do not spot austerity, right? If think about the United States in this moment or um, many other countries at the moment, if you look at the aggregate spending of the state, you might not actually notice austerity because the state is indeed spending a ton of money, uh, of course, on the military industrial complex, for example, or on um, subsidizing private investment for the green economy, for example, and so on and so forth. So what is important here is to say it's not just about the budget decreasing, it's about the state actively cutting social expenditures and transferring the money from social expenditures to indeed incentivizing the shareholders, the so-called savers investors. So this is the first element of fiscal austerity. It's not about just what it, whether the state spends or not, but where the state spends. And you, what you find out is that austerity is structurally about diminishing the resources for public schools, for healthcare, for um, public transport, for, for housing, all of those resources that indeed served, served to diminish market dependence of the majority, right? Meaning that we those resources that serve to less, uh, make us less dependent on selling our capacity to work on the market in exchange for a wage. And in the meantime, resources, the state spends tons of resources incentivizing, subsidizing private profit. So this is the first element of fiscal austerity. The second element of fiscal austerity is, of course, um, to do with taxation. It's not whether the state just increases taxes, but again, who does the state tax? And what you find out that austerity is all about regressive taxation, right? So while you increase the consumption, taxes that hit everyone alike. And we know that actually most countries today, actually workers pay a far greater share of taxes than corporations, than the wealthy, right? So what? while we see very low inheritance taxes, very low corporate taxes and, and structural potential to evade taxation if you're at the top, the, the, ta the burden of the tax the tax burden is actually on the shoulders of the working people. This is fiscal austerity. Regressive taxation and cuts in social expenditures to favor other forms of expenditures that are not directly for the people. Then we have, though, fiscal austerity has to be understood together with monetary austerity. So what we've been witnessing for at least three years now, and the Fed just announced that there is no prospect of, for now of actually starting to increase the interest rates. Monetary austerity is about curtailing credit, making borrowing money more expensive. Mm -hmm. And who does this hit? Of course, again, we realize that this is not a neutral mechanism to stabilize our money, but it's, of course, a, uh, a policy that 
puts the sacrifice once more on the working people, not just because it's more difficult to get hold of a mortgage and um, take on debt, but especially because as Jerome Powell and other officials know very well, it cools down the labor market, meaning that there's less job opportunities, the unemployment rate starts going up, and this is considered healthy because this allows us to actually compress wages, right? Healthy, of course, for the logic of a capitalist economy. Um, furthermore, we have industrial austerity. Industrial austerity is about privatization. It's about deregulation of the labor market, making labor more precarious and more flexible. And all those policies that indeed serve, that the state uses directly to fundamentally weaken the working classes. So we see that fiscal, monetary, and industrial austerity have to be understood as a, what I call a trinity in my work, the trinity of austerity that enhance one another and actually depend on one another. So a big intuition for us is to realize that fiscal and monetary policies are never disconnected to labor relations, and especially indeed once more to stabilize class relations. Okay, so it's very important to keep in mind that um, how political macroeconomic policy is, and by political I mean that is indeed deeply impacting the power relations that are at the basis of our capitalist economy. So I spoke very generally here because I just wanted to make sure that some macroeconomic intuitions were obvious from the start um, about how we can really start looking at austerity differently. And if you look at austerity in this way, there's a more fundamental intuition that emerges, which is the, the following. There's nothing spontaneous of our market economy, right? The market economy that is based actually on the sacrifice of the many. And again, I think it is very important for economists to rethink the importance of the concept of exploitation in the technical sense introduced by Smith, Ricardo, and Marx about how the fact that there's value production in our economy, the fact that we see GDP growth is based on technically the fact that workers produce far more value than the value they earn in their paycheck. Okay, so this is very important. So once we understand that this is how our market economy runs, we understand that there's very little spontaneity, spontaneity to it. Of course, we learn um, at school that the market reflects some intrinsic features of our essence as rational maximizers. But what you realize is actually that historically, and this is why I think the work of his history should be constitutive of economic theory and of macroeconomic theory and should not be left as an addition. You cannot understand our, our economy without taking history seriously. What you see if you take history seriously is that the markets need constant protection. And this is indeed the active role of the capitalist state through austerity in serving the purpose of maintaining the fundamentals of our system in place. So that you realize that not only our system is not spontaneous, you also realize that what appears to common people as problems, for example, unemployment, poverty, precarity, for the system, they're actually solutions. Meaning that that vulnerability of the majority is indeed what keeps the system from being questioned and potentially transformed into a greater democratic economic organization. Mm -hmm. So all of this that I've said, and I don't know how much I spoke, we started a little bit later. How much do I have still? Five minutes? What? When did I start? I think I have 10 more minutes. Does anyone know? I think I started. You have about seven minutes left. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So that I know how much I don't want to. Okay, so I gave just some general insights. What I want to say is that um, all of this that I've said has not just come out of um, 
a vacuum, but is actually based on historical, empirical and qualitative research that I've undertook indeed in the book, The Capital Order. So what I did in this book is actually go and study the moment in history in which capitalism was undergoing the greatest existential crisis. Again, not just an uptick in inflation or a problem of economic growth, but a fundamental questioning of the pillars that are at its basis, right? Wage relations and private property of the means of production. This occurred after the Great War. The Red Biennium 1919-1920 triggered an enormous amount of alternative practices to run the economy that were taking place in Great Britain and in Italy, for example. These are the two countries I focus on. Of course, they're taking place in a lot of other places. But what is interesting is that capitalism was being questioned and actually fundamentally understood as an anachronistic system that would be surpassed at, in the hub of Western, of the Western world, okay? So what I show in the book is that how this existential crisis of the system had been triggered by the unprecedented political intervention of the state to run the war economy uh, between four, 1914 and 1918. And by the state becoming the main producer and the main employer, um, what had been until now, until then considered a natural given namely laissez-faire capitalism, was being really understood as a, the outcome of very specific classist decisions that were also inefficient and thus could be overcome with forms of worker self-management. In Britain, there was the very famous, for example, just to give you one example of the many that, I, um, that I've studied, um, was the Sankey Committee. The Sankey Committee in 1919 was about actually nationalizing coal production, so the main energy source, um, together with um, workers' collaboration in the production process. Um, I look at a variety of experiments from the reconstruction, the Ministry of Reconstruction in Britain that was all about actually putting human needs prior to economic needs, of course, something that is incompatible with the logic of capitalism, to forms of radical workers' councils that were happening all over, and especially in Italy, under the leadership of Antonio Gramsci. So in all of this moment of potential transformative process, in which also bourgeois newspapers had no understanding that the system could survive, so I, you know, I... All the work has been done by looking at the archives, but also newspapers of the time. And what you see, if that if you read the Times and the Economist, no one thinks the system would survive very long. And it's at this moment that what you discover is that austerity emerges as the most powerful weapon from the part of the ruling classes to reestablish the capital order. So the, the story I tell takes place in Brussels and Genoa initially, the two first international financial conferences in 1919 and 19, no, sorry, in 1920 and 1922. So 1920, Brussels, 1922, Genoa. Conferences that were fundamental to put together the austerity code with the, th the trinity that I've just discussed with you. So if you look at actually the source of the time, the memorandum and the actual um, formal resolutions, the Austerity Trinity emerges very clearly. And the motto of those of that time is work more, consume less. Live hard, save hard, work hard. These are words used by the technocrats that were called to participate. And for the first time, academics, professors, the founding fathers of marginalism were participating in um, directing the new austerity code. So this big th understanding that the solution to the crisis was to impose the right amount of sacrifice of the majority that were just thinking they deserve too much, but really they should just go and accept what the natural order to them was. So I just wanna read you uh, a quote from, this is from, the records of the Brussels conference. This is R.H. Brand, financier of the British delegation. He says, 
It is a paradox of the situation that urgent as this limitation of expenditure on financial and economic grounds, the whole force of public opinion still seems to be exerted in the opposite direction. The manual workers expect some new way of life, some greater betterment of their lot. They do not realize the hard truth that a better life can only be achieved through labor and suffering. So this is his words, right? So very strong understanding of being encircled, being threatened, um, how the fragility of the system is clearly exposed and their need to go back and reassert the capital order via austerity. So in the few minutes that I have left, I can't say very much. The book is very complex, but I just want to indicate this. What I did in the book is actually go and do a comparative work on what happened in Italy and what happened in Britain um, in the 1920s. Um, why this comparison? Austerity was implemented many other places at that moment. I like the comparison because it was really what we normally understand as opposite worlds. The birthplace of fascism, Benito Mussolini coming to power in October 1922, and the cradle of parliamentary democracy, the empire, the very strong economy versus Italy, a very backward and nascent capitalist economy. Well, so what you see is that what appear as like really opposite worlds, if you look at them through the lens of austerity and the application of austerity and the support for austerity, the two stories are much more similar than what we would think. And so this is ultimately the analysis is to look at how austerity was implemented in these countries. And again, the Trinity emerges in all the details of the various policies that I cannot get into here, but I look very detailed at the policies. And of course, at the effects of these policies, I have a whole empirical chapter, chapter nine, that shows how, for example, the wage share and the profit share completely revert and very quickly. So if the wage share had grown exponentially after the First World War during the Red Biennium, with the application of austerity, of course, it loses and the profit share instead increases. So do the profit rates while, of course, strikes immediately come down, right? The other thing I note is that while in Britain, austerity takes more of the form that we're used to today as what is going on in the United States, for example, with the deflation that is, of course, of course, worldwide, is that in Britain, austerity was able to disempower the working class demands via harsh deflation that promoted a very hard recession in the economy. So what you see is actually that interest rates in April 1920 went up to 7%, and quickly there is a recession that hits and unemployment rates skyrocket. As soon as unemployment rates skyrocket, of course, you see immediately that the strikes dwindle and fall and that wages are brought down. So GDH Cole, who is a protagonist of my work, a guild socialist who was participating in the years, really says it clearly. He says, you know, there's a short short term cost, which is, of course, that British manufacturers immediately lose their capacity to export because of the reevaluation of the pound. But the structural gain is the fact that you have stabilized the class relations that are once more what the capitalist economy requires to run properly. So these stabilizations take priority for austerity. That's why it's not just irrationality. It actually serves as much deeper political purpose. In Italy, we see, of course, the much more outright intervention of the fascist state. Um, in, for example, directly repressing wages and outlawing unions and beating political opposition by law. But what is interesting is that I have a whole chapter showing how Benito Mussolini was the mascot of the liberal elite in those years. So funnily enough, um, all the British technocrats, all the liberals also in Italy were very proud of the capacity of Mussolini to impose industrial peace. So I would like just to end by reading a quote. I went to the archives of the Bank of England. I spent a lot of time in the archives, almost 10 years this book took. Um, this is even Montagu Norman, the governor of the Bank of England, who expressed wariness of the fact that under fascism, anything in the way of otherness was eliminated, eliminated and opposition in the form of, of 
sorry, and opposition in any form was gone, added in the same breath, the state of affair is suitable at present and may provide for the moment the administration best adapted for Italy. He continued, fascism has surely brought order out of chaos over the last few years. Something of the kind was no doubt needed if the pendulum was not to swing too far in quite the other direction. The Duce was the right man at a critical moment. So the alliance between authoritarian governments and austerity is very, very common throughout the 20th and 21st century. And um, I would say it is exposing some harsher realities of our economy that as economists, we have to have now the courage to expose. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. That was fantastic. And uh, reminding us that econo economic policy does not exist in a vacuum, but is much wider uh, social relations. Before I open up to the floor for some questions, can I just ask one question that was going through my mind was back in the 1920s, of course, we didn't have um, everybody having the same vote. Women didn't have a vote. Um, and so in some ways, the um, power structures were able to impose this hardship. But today it seems quite ironic that when we have inflation, you have the most, the biggest criticism of the Bank of England for not doing enough, I being too slow. And the, you have, the people are supposed to represent more of the workers actually themselves seem to go for austerity. It seems to be quite a popular thing that people want to vote for something which makes them almost poorer. So austerity is, doesn't seem to be something that gets imposed on people without a say, but people with a say seem to be willing to impose it on themselves at the moment, which seems to be rather paradoxical. Mm -hmm. So first of all, would you comment on that? What, what is going on? Are people just completely brainwashed or what is happening there? So um, I have lots to say on this. Um, first, maybe on the first part of your question, which is the fact that um, I think very important is the fact that we have normalized central banks as independent bodies, right? And so the first uh, thing you see is actually that um, the years I study are years in which the universal suffrage is being won by the workers, right? This is part of what they, in a way, achieve after having uh, sacrificed themselves during the war. And um, th they were opening up. So actually, uh, all men could vote in 1918, and women uh, with property could vote as well. So it's interesting to see that as the um, democratic space opens up, and there are really de claims for or demands for democratic participation in the economy. Um, the effort of the technocrats is to de-democratize the economic realm. And how do you do it? In, in Italy, you go the fascist route. In England, it's done through, indeed, the battle for independent central banks. So the, 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 the protagonist of my book that I didn't even mention in this talk, for example, Ralph Hawtrey, who was the in-house economy of the British Treasury in the interwar period, and he's one of the big exponents of the austerity doctrine, he was struggling to implement in the, the, in, in an independent central bank and export it indeed in Brazil, in Argentina, in India. So my, my experts were actually exporting the concept of independent central bank around the world that, that moment. And he put it very well. He said, central bank should never regret, sorry, never explain, never regret, never apologize. So the clear understanding that already emerges at the Brussels and Genoa conference, that the only way in which you can have the, the power to actually impose on people hard dosage of deflation to stabilize the economy is if there is no democratic liability and no intrusion per, from the political sphere. And of course, this we well know is the ECB right now is the most independent central bank in the world in its constitution. So this is the first part, right? So how in a way our voices are already macro, the privilege to have access to the dials of macroeconomic management is right now taken away from people, right? It's 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 the it's the realm of the expert, and they safeguard this institutionally, right? So a very hard way of de-democratizing macroeconomics that is no longer a possibility of public discussion. So this is the first point, and it, this I think speaks to the second point, which is yes. Um, People have been disempowered in all possible ways, right? Materially speaking, losing access to uh, participating in economic decisions, 
and of course may, being made poorer and more precarious by austerity and this ultimately eliminating capacity to participate in collectives to think like ours about what is happening in the world, right? This is a privilege of very few academics uh, of which we are part, but normal people have to just um, think about getting to the end of the month and paying their bills and working at a job they usually hate. Um, and in the meantime, the fact is that there's a lot of economic models that serve, and this is all the part that I did not talk about in my book. I look at, at how what type of economic theory serves to justify austerity. And what you realize is that the models that tell you that the workers are not the center and the source of value, but it is the saver investors. And the savers investors can be potentially any individuals who har try hard enough and make it at the top. This type of meritocratic and methodological individualism, um, people have internalized, um, but this has been an enormous ideological effort from the part of academic institutions as well to promote this sense of passive acceptance of class society, right? So I think this is, it speaks, so the fact that people might vote for austerity, and first of all, I'm not really sure in the sense that I think people realize that's why the experts need to take away the decisions from people because people would like to vote for greater health care, for greater, um, better schools for their children, for daycare that is 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 not um, a commodity and all these things. I think people understand the economic coercion and would fight against it. But it is true that we are victims of the ideology that actually like is transmitted top down from these economic models that serve to say people don't deserve to have more than they do, right? So I do think that we see the expression, those who do vote for austerity is because they ultimately have bought into the propaganda that ultimately starts from very early on. And actually, I would just like to finish by saying that in my book, the technocrats were going uh, as part of these saving committees uh, around England and the United States to teach children that they would need to be um, they would need to practice abstinence by actually putting away the penny, not using it for their for their candy, but giving it to for the war bonds during the war. OK, so this th thing about like actually ha having to pedagogically shape the minds of the working classes is something that, of course, already Malthus saw, Malthus saw much earlier on, but it's clearly part of the austerity agenda. And then the expression is that people fall victim of these these ideas that, of course, go against their interest, but are portrayed as, of course, the interest of the whole. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to ask for two more questions and take them together, and it's up to you how much, which one you'd like to answer, and how how much. This gentleman, and is there another question? Oh, yes, Michael. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Hello. Um... Hi, because I can't even see the room. I don't even know who's in the room, how many are in the room, nothing, because I only see you, actually. So oh, I don't know okay. if there's a way to like move the camera so I can see at least who's asking the question. So um, let me ask the question. We'll try. We'll, we'll see what we can do while the question's being asked. How about that? Yes. Yeah. Should, should I come there? Oh. <laughs> Lots of movement. Oh, very loud. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, Clara. Brunello. Yes, hello. From um, Rosa Rubini Associates, also various academic affiliations, including the LSE and City University. Um, a question. Um, you spoke about how austerity may pave the way to fascism. In today's world, we would use the, the lighter word populism or something along those lines. So I was wondering whether you could draw a, a parallel between what happened in the 1920s in uh, Italy and the UK, and what happened uh, in the 2020s or 2010s in Italy and the UK when we had two massive uh, uh, austerity experiments. One, uh, you want the one you mentioned before, that eventually led to the Five Star to come to power, and eventually the um, uh, Meloni's uh, Fratelli Italia, and in the UK, uh, effectively uh, paved the way to. Uh, Brexit. Uh, a comment on this. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes. Should I take the last, the other one? The last one. Hi, this is Michael with the Christian, the other speaker, actually. Uh, Clara, I was just wondering if you could, uh, I guess, say what you think a better system would look like and what the pathway would be from where we are to, to that better system. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so um, the parallelism uh, unfortunately speaks uh, not great about the present in the sense that actually um, the title of the book might be misleading. What I try to do in the book is actually to show how fascism required austerity to uh, become established and a full-blown regime because of the support it obtained uh, from the liberals, both domestically and internationally, in its capacity to implement the correct economic policies, right? So actually, um, this is what you saw then, is that Mussolini explicitly portrayed himself as the man for austerity, as the man that would reimpose law and order and uh, suppress wages in order to guarantee the revaluation of the lira and um, the, um, the 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 attraction of a foreign capital as well, right? So the close alliance, of course, with J.P. Morgan Chase and many others, um, is very important in the Italian case. Um, right now, I think what we see is that actually um, these uh, authoritarian governments come to power with the promise of defeating austerity oftentimes. At least this was the case for uh, Giorgia Meloni, right? So she actually, she didn't even get that many more votes because many people actually just stopped voting altogether. Um, but those few votes she got more than usual, she got because she was saying, I'm going to actually give some social resources, for example, through many subsidies she was suggesting she would do and oppose somehow the Troika. What happens, of course, is that when she came to power, um, she just completely continued in a harsher vein the policies of the Monti, the Draghi's, and everyone before her, right? To the point that she even abolished the citizenship income, which were very meager subsidies for the poorest families in Italy. So I think this speaks to the fact that uh, there is a deep need of actually having a, a proper alternative to austerity. People vote authoritarian because ultimately Austerity has been a, a, a policies that has been applied across party lines, the Labour Party and the Tories, the part, Democratic Party in Italy and the right. They're all doing austerity and they have been all doing austerity for, for decades now. Right. I actually would claim for a century. Um, and that's anyway. Well, um, so right. So basically what um, what clearly it's clearly speaks to the fact that people are disillusioned by the technocratic elitism of previous governments, but of course um, are then fall, fall prey of these false alternatives that ultimately then end up only blaming the weakest through the harsh migration policies. Right. So um, I would. The word populism for me is problematic because it tends to put the blame on the people for voting um, populist instead of realizing that populism is an instrument of capital reproduction to kind of distract people from class analysis, which is really what needs to be brought back um, on stage. And this, I would say, then reflects to the other uh, goes to the other question, which is the alternatives. Well, listen, I've been talking a lot. First of all, what makes me happy is that um, this these ideas that I'm circulating are gaining traction, and I'm I'm speaking everywhere from the UN. Last week, yesterday, I was at the at the conference of the Social Democratic Party in Germany. So just to tell you, like very like also very mainstream um, venues in a way are interested in um, voices that try to get a little bit deeper and problematize the very logic of our capitalist economic system. Um, and so this makes me optimistic, actually. And I, I do think that the whole point here is that um, governments won't spontaneously um, enact measures that are counter the logic of austerity, because, again, this would mean going counter the logic of capitalism. And this is problematic for a capitalist state. This only happens if there is actual pressure uh, from below, right? If there's actual mobilization and pressure from below. And this is the beauty of studying history. I would really um, would love if you had time to actually read the first part of the book because it is extremely inspiring for today. What, what was possible in 1919 and 1920 in terms of actual 
super emancipatory project for, for example, urban uplift of people, communal homes being built so that working women could actually ha have help um, keeping the children while they were in the holidays or permanent adult education projects. So a whole spectrum uh, of possibilities. All these possibilities, though, clearly meant going against the logic of capitalism. And so actually realizing that it is not enough to try to make environmental transformation and social expenditures compatible with the logic of profit because they are structurally incompatible, right? Because we are in a system in which the purpose of production is structurally detached from the fulfillment of people's needs. Exchange value has very little to do with use value in the end of the day, at the end of the day. So this is really, really important. And I think that what needs to be done is for people to understand critically how the system works, realize its limits, its political and economic limits, and the two go together, of course. And at that point, then pressure for policies that are indeed counter the logic of the system. And this will mean, of course, a struggle because um, there will be capital flights, there will be negative rankings on the market, there will be all the forms of blackmail that uh, we are used to when a country tries to um, implement alternatives that are for the people and not against the people. But I do think that the first step in the direction is indeed to stop idealizing our system, stop thinking that you can have economic growth and growth in profits and social needs net met, and trying to actually understand how political our economy is. And thus, this will help us have new instruments to actually have the political courage to put our needs first. And this will then have to entail, I think, structural transformation, but this can be gradual if there is an understanding that, of course, one has to be courageous and participate and gain agency in this transformation. Well, thank you very much indeed. You've been extremely generous with your time and we'll let you get on with the rest of your day. And I hope you can hear a round of applause which is coming your way. Thank you. It was lovely to talk to you. I'm, I hope to be there in person if there's another happening and gathering. Thank, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Clara. you. Have a bye great bye. rest of the day. Bye, Alan. Bye -bye. Also, bye, Alan Kierman. <laughs> I haven't seen him in a long time. Bye, bye. Thank you for everything. See you soon. <clears throat> okay, this brings us to our third speaker today, and a great friend of rebuilding macroeconomics, <laughs> Professor Alan Kierman, uh, who's had a remarkable career. And now, when people normally talk about applied economics, they talk about regressions. Uh, Alan studies. Uh, fish markets in France, or the behavior of ants. Now, that's probably applied economics, or applied research anyway. Alan's published over 150 uh, 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 scientific journal articles and authored over 15 books. And if I might choose one, it's the complex economics, individual and collective rationality. I think that last term, collective rationality, is quite uh, um, poignant for what we've been talking about today. So, Alan, we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. And uh, if you'd like to come to the front, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Angus, for inviting me here. And uh, I'm very pleased to hear the sort of things that we've already um, heard about, particularly from Michael. And in some sense, what I'm going to do is the uh, sort of a follow up to what's been going on here, the, uh, the speech that's been going on. And uh, I hope that in some sense, what I'm gonna to try to do is to link what I usually think about, which is complex systems, how they work, all the interactions and so forth, and how everything feeds back into everything else to the underlying problems of our economic policies. And whether I'll be successful or not, it's a different question. So should I make a signal to you? And so there you go. So. <laughs> Uh, I think our basic problem, and uh, one which you, you heard a lot last year, because last year was the 300th anniversary of the birth of Adam Smith. So you heard of the heritage of Adam Smith, you have the Adam Smith Society and so forth. And what it uh, preached to you about uh, what Adam Smith had to say 
was actually not very close to what Adam Smith really thought. It was much more subtle and much more um, varied than well, the way it was portrayed. And so what happened was originally, we've had now, let's say two centuries, I would say, more or less, of a, a system which we thought of, and it comes from the Enlightenment, and it's based on fundamental principles. One is that we should build everything on individual rationality and individual uh, division, decision making. And, and the other is that uh, somehow no super uh, structure should impinge on people's capacity to express themselves as they want. And the only time when you interfere with them, the state and so forth, is basically to control them within certain very limited rules, okay? So that's the sort of basic framework within which we've been working. And I think you could uh, classify neoliberalism, as it's now called, as being the sort of reflection of that and pushed much further than it used to be um, of that tradition. And many of our current uh, political figures as, as basically adhere to that. They don't say they do, but uh, if you're living in my country, and what's now my country, France, uh, when I hear Macron recommending things, I know that what Macron has behind his head is, if only we could privatize all this, everything will be okay again. But um, of course, uh, uh, then you have all sorts of protests periodically. But anyway, I, it's, as I say, these ideas are attributed to Adam Smith. And uh, so I think it's somewhat unfair by the, for Sorry, yeah. So the picture that we, uh, I think, we taught our students for many years was that the economy is like a ship sailing on a steady path, occasionally buffeted from that by shocks. And so you will notice that until today, in economics, we talk whenever something seems to go a little bit wrong, it's a shock to the system. It's not something that sort of is part of the evolution of the system. It's a shock comes from outside, an exogenous shock in general. And so there you see this ship sailing through. Some of you may recognize that ship, um, sailing calmly through these waters. And of course, it's the Titanic. But um, anyway, next one, please. So you remember this famous quote from Adam Smith, where he says, well, it's because people work in their own interests that uh, the whole system works properly. And so that's a quote that's remembered all the time. But you, we should look at the next quote, which says, the rich consume little more than the poor. And in spite of their natural selfishness and rapacity, so he wasn't a very generous person about people, they divide with the poor the produce of all their improvements. They're led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life, which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions to start with. So you see that Adam Smith was suggesting that we're basically all starting from the same point. And I think that's something that Thomas Piketty would not agree with. Next. But all of a sudden, you read something which was written, actually, at roughly the same time as the other thing, but published later in the Wealth of Nations. But he says, the silent and insensible operation of foreign commerce gradually brought about a situation where well-off individuals uh, gave, had an opportunity to exchange the whole surplus produce, produce of their lands without sharing it either with tenants or retainers. All for ourselves and nothing for other people seems in every age of the world to have been the vile maxim of the masters of mankind. That's very different from the previous quote. That suggests that uh, we were, uh, the only problem was that people hadn't worked out how to exploit other people and take everything for themselves. And so Adam Smith was not convinced that we were actually uh, faced with a, a more equal world. And uh, I remember Boris Johnson giving the Margaret Thatcher lecture in which he paraphrased her approach and he said, greed, a valuable spur to economic activity. And you may remember that people went, went around saying greed is good. And I think 
there is Smith would not have accepted that. And so what, how was it supposed to work? Well, there's this claim that somehow there was this invisible hand when you left people to their own devices, then everything would converge to a desirable situation. But in fact, we have no theoretical uh, uh, proof of that and we have no empirical evidence for that. And so this is the invisible hand. You should always have a picture of what you're talking about. And uh, Joe Stiglitz once said, the invisible hand is invisible because it's not there. <laughs> But it's what we have to look at really is the world as it is, I think. And the world is a system of interacting components and they can self-organize into aggregate state, which are not intended by the individual components. But there's nothing to suggest uh, naturally that those aggregate states will be optimal in any sense. So we're normally told that, uh, of course, uh, what we're coming to is the fundamental, first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, which says, you know, perfect competition uh, will lead you to a Pareto optimal state. But we don't can't actually show that theoretically, and nor have we empirical evidence for that. Next. So the question is, how does this get sorted out? Is there an invisible hand? Or what happens when we get into difficulties? And so what do we do? To whom do we turn? Well, the whole uh, essence of the previous this uh, discourse is that we don't want uh, too much government. The less government interference there is, the better the system will work. And yet what happens whenever we get into difficulties, we call on the government. And the two examples here I give, uh, the example I give here is climate. For example, when things go really wrong with the climate, what happens? Do we say, my goodness me, we should uh, organize ourselves better? Not at all. We say the government should pay up uh, a, a form of insurance and that uh, when your house gets uh, flooded or so forth the government will participate in compensating you so in other words as soon as there's difficulty we're turning to the government which we basically claim we want to minimize and then secondly the same story of course in finance too when there's a financial collapse what do we do we turn to the government to sort it out or turn to the central bank to sort it out we don't think, ah, oh, well, the system will self-organize itself and get it get us back on track. Next. And this sort of thing happens. And when it happens, do we say, ah, oh, well, wait a minute, we, our little human system should self-organize itself to get around that? No. We say the government should take its responsibility. And, uh, and it does, of course. Uh, and the whole point is that the role of the government is seen now, I think, more as being somebody who's helping us out of these bad shocks. In the past, of course, we were perfectly happy with that when we had a war. That's exactly who we turned to. And here, now at the moment, we do in some sense have, on the one hand, real wars and also uh, wars against climate. And the only way we have for the moment of getting around them is to organize ourselves through the government to try and sort this out. And now, as a result of climate change, you can see what's going on. So I think the second remark about climate is not only does it have direct effects, it has all sorts of indirect effects. And this is a, an example that I wanted to give you, which is that in New, in New Orleans, for example, when there was a hurricane, most of the people who died didn't die of uh, uh, because of the direct effect of the hurricane, but the indirect effects. And when there was the cold snap in uh, uh, Texas, which was unexpected, people died of carbon monoxide poisoning because people were using heating at home uh, and because they weren't used to dealing with cold situations. And so you have all these indirect effects, which are also spilling on so I think that's something that the external effects, if you like, which we have not taken enough account of, and for which suddenly it was the government that becomes responsible. Next. So what's going on? Is, can we do something about all of this? And uh, the first remark is to say the somebody 
in some sense, should have been responsible for worrying about what was going on with the climate. And in fact, we have sort of turned our backs on that and still do, I think. Too many people are talking about climate as if it's sort of something that's going to happen. It's not going to happen, it's happening. And this person here, Giorgio Parisi, is a very uh, interesting example of how we should be helped. Giorgio Parisi points out that the climate system as it is, has been badly described by physics in the past. Climate physics has not taken account of all the changes. And in particular, what he says is, you know, if you think of the system of the climate as an ongoing process, which is what we've done, and on top of that, you have a bit of noise, and noise is weather. You know, and the weather is what throws it off course temporarily, and back we come. And the point is that Parisi showed that in many such systems, and in particular referred to the climate, what happens is you don't get back to quote normal, that the underlying process is interfered with by this noise on the top. So noise is not just something added on. Noise is part of the system. And noise can send the whole thing off on another track. And if we don't learn that lesson, then we're going to be faced with changes in the climate, which are far from what we hope to get with our nice one degree global. And again, the measures that we use to explain what's going on are not the appropriate measures because they're uniform. And the effect of climate change will be far from uniform across the planet. And so we're not dealing with these problems by looking at what's really going on. We're dealing with them by talking about them, making gestures for them, but we're not dealing with them by taking really serious concrete measures. And we'll have to do it. Next, sorry. And uh, oh, so I don't have time to talk about this because uh, uh, I just want to make this one remark that noise in the system, if you've done a lot of econometrics and other things, Noise is still something's added on. It just interferes with the system, and then the system gets back on track. And in fact, noise is an integral part of these program of these uh, processes. And that integral part can knock the thing off course, not in the short run only, but also in the longer run. And so this interaction between the noise, so-called, and the underlying process can cause radical changes, which you, we haven't actually built into our uh, forecasts and so forth. And the climate change models that have been used uh, since Nordhaus and so forth have failed to take account of that and should take account of that. So when you hear them say, you know, four degrees warming might be optimal, then you should really be scared because four degrees warming backwards, if you like, would take us to the quaternary ice age. And uh, so <laughs> I don't know uh, how you think you would survive in the quaternary ice age, but it's not going to be good. And uh, so I, I, I think the point is we have to take into account that there's more going on in the physical system than we claim in our very simple models. Next. Okay, so that's what Bensi, a co colleague of uh, 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 the uh, of, um, George, George Parisi said, he basically says, you know, noise is, noise is really a part of the system, and if we don't allow for it, we're not going to be able to deal with the system. Next, please. Okay, so what I wanted to say very quickly is that if you look at our models of the economy now, not the physical system, but the economy, they're built on very shaky foundations. And uh, if you're interested in pure theory, of course, you know De Brewer, Mantel, and so on and so on, who basically said, you know, we don't really, aren't really able to explain what goes on in the economy from a theoretical point of view. GE doesn't give us the answers. Next, please. And so what are the difficulties with our description of the economy and why does it make it difficult for us to make policy recommendations? Well, first of all, we can't show that an economy that's out of equilibrium will ever get to one. So that's really an important problem because we always deal with what happens in equilibrium. And secondly, we can't show that even if there is an equilibrium, it will be unique. There may be a different equilibrium. We may be going one way and think we're going the other way. So we continue to analyze models with unique stable equilibrium, which is not a reflection of reality. 
And uh, the other thing about it is that sometimes when you give a talk like this, people say, yeah, okay, that's right. And, uh, underlying GE models are really not very satisfactory, but financial economics, that's under control. We got that, we got that down, but it's built on equally sh shaky foundations. So let's look very rapidly at financial markets, market models. And these share very simple building blocks. The agents in them have simple ways of forecasting the future prices. That determines how much they wish to buy. That determines the price of the assets. And when that price comes back in, then that price will influence people's forecasts in the futures. Very simple arrangement. And uh, it would seem that that should be something you could analyze and produce analytical results. And so what we've used in, the, in that framework is the efficient markets hypothesis. And that you know the efficient markets hypothesis, all of you good economists, you know that. It says all relevant information is contained in prices. Okay, so you don't need to look anywhere else. Everything, all the information in the economy gets into the prices. But then there's a the famous paradox, which is a, how does it get into the prices? Well, it gets into the prices because people act when they see prices change. So they do something. And when they do something, that's visible. And so people get the knowledge that the other people have. But that's totally unreasonable because that says that if all the knowledge was already in the prices, why would you ever look at your prices? And that's the famous Grossman Stiglitz paradox. But the point is that the, the story behind the invisible hand is really not a very good one. And here is Henri Poincaré. Why should I put him up there now, physicist? When he had to deal with ba Bachelier's thesis, m many of you may remember Bachelier, of course, he's the originator in some sense of the theory of efficient markets, the efficient markets hypothesis. Bachelier said, you know, reading Bachelier, uh, sorry, Poincaré said, you know, reading this thesis, uh, the one thing that struck me was that it's uh, nice mathematics, but has nothing to do with reality. And why is that? Because he said, unfortunately, people do not just look at their own information and then, then act on it. What they do is look at what other people are doing first, and then they act on it. So the information you're supposed to be transmitting into the system from your own information is not really that. It's because you're also following what the other people are doing. And that sort of herd behavior can be terribly destructive. And uh, financial crises in general are, are usually associated at some point with herd behavior. And the latest uh, bubble of that sort is, of course, Bitcoin. Now, some people will say, oh, that's not a, really a bubble. You know, that's going to be the, the technical future. But I, I don't believe it. I think uh, we're back to the same story as we were with tulip bulbs. It's just now you have to have something more sophisticated. You tell people blockchain and stuff, oh, blockchain, well. Wow. And everybody's sort of baffled by that. They don't know what that even means, but they're prepared to buy uh, Bitcoins. Okay, so Poincaré said, I'm sorry, dear boy, liked your thesis, but uh, didn't like the conclusions because I think they're wrong. And that's why poor old Bashley had a lousy career. Next. Uh, and here's another reaction to the efficient markets hypothesis. What did Alan Greenspan say in 2008? He said, the whole intellectual edifice collapsed in the summer of last year. So everything that we built our story about financial markets in, on seemed to have collapsed. It's gone away. And that's pretty bad for people who are making policy. And so once again, we come back to the story of this conference. Uh, <clears throat> when you're trying to make policy and then you confess in public as the chairman of the Fed, you know, it's pretty bad. You say, well, it's all collapsed. But he was back on back on track later on. Next. Uh, yeah, by the way, that's what uh, Paul Krugman quoted from Menken about the efficient markets hypothesis. There's always an easy solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. Next, please. Oh, there are these people who are taking their own information and acting on it independently of the others, as you can see. Next. And so, as I said, the efficient markets hypothesis went wrong, not because people didn't act on information, but they also looked at what other people were doing. And that produces these phenomena of 
the many bubbles, and I have a whole history of bubbles. Next. And uh, here's how you create a bubble. Those guys <laughs> stood in Times Square. They were students in sociology, I think, if I remember rightly, and stared up at the sky. And after a while, there were 5,000 people staring up at the sky <laughs> because people don't stare up in the sky unless there's somebody to see up there. So you have, you have exactly the effect that tulip bubbles and everything else. And, and you can see them all, even the cat. But, uh, <laughs> next, please. And here's a simple illustration of what goes on in these markets. It says here, I've got a stock here that could really excel, really excel, sell, sell, sell. And they all go mad. And, then, and this guy down at the bottom says, this is madness. I can't take it anymore. Goodbye, goodbye, bye, bye. And off they go again. And down at the bottom here on the right, you see, I've got a stock here. And off we go again. Next, please. So what do we have to explain in the economy? We keep talking about shocks. But people say, yeah, but when when this change happened in the price ind index, for example, stock price index, then we should find the news that generated that. And what we should explain is that whenever we have a sudden large movement, we have to better find the piece of news that generated that. Next. And here was a, the, an old uh, slide from the German DAX uh, index. And suddenly what happened in the next one, you can see, is that it collapsed, right? But there's no particular event there which made that happen. And that's the important thing. This was not a huge shock from the outside, some piece of news that arrived. This was an in, uh, endogenous thing to do with the collapse of the dot-com bubble. Next. So what can you say about that sort of thing? Well, I would say the last of those things, you try and find a model of interacting agents which actually generates that sort of shift and doesn't need some mysterious shock or the invisible hand of Jupiter, as Adam Smith called it. Next. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to even talk about behavioral economics because uh, what it says is basically you will find whenever you try and test people, um, they don't obey the usual axioms. They don't obey our theory of rationality. In other words, people are not rational in the, stand, in the sense of our axioms. So they have biases, we're told. But why should they be biases from our idea of what rationality is? Maybe they have their own rationality. Indeed, Pareto said so. Next, please. Yeah, here's what Pareto said. The reasons that people in society give themselves for doing what they do or believing what they believe are, except for reasons of instrumental rationality. That means, you know, when I go out and buy something, I intend to buy it, and that's the end. They are, in fact, disguising the real causes of their actions and beliefs, which should be looked for in their hypothetical feelings. So Pareto said people spend some of their time uh, making irrational decisions and the rest of their time rationalizing them. Next. So what do I claim we should use as a system and then how will that help us making better policy? Well, a complex system is a system in which the components interact together and as a result generate aggregate behavior. And what we have always been taught is, well, at least since Lucas, is that what we need is sound micro foundations. If people are rational enough, then we'll better say what's going on. That'll be great. But unfortunately, that's not enough. And physicists have told us in the past that having sound micro foundations will not solve your problem of finding out what's going on in the aggregate. And that's one of our fundamental problems with the sort of models that have been built in macro. The whole idea of rational expectations imposes a sort of rationality that people don't seem to actually have. Next, please. And uh, that's a quote from Phil Anderson. Don't have time to explain it to you, but just to say that when you have a system and you add more and more people act, interacting together, new phenomena appear, which you could not derive from looking at individuals. So the point is, unless you look at the aggregate, you will not learn everything about the aggregate behavior. You'll get your, you'll be, deviated into trying to explain it in terms of individual behavior. Next, please. So, as I said, systems of interacting 
components can organize themselves into aggregate states. That's true. However, there's no a priori reason to think that those aggregate states are optimal in any sense. Next, please. Oh, we came back to him again. So jump back, please. And again. And again. Yeah. And last thing I wanted to say is if we're interested really in, pol in policy and making better policy, rather than worry about optimizing, finding the optimal solution, we should be worried about resilience. How can we make our system more resilient to what's happening? And what do I mean by resilient? Sorry, yeah. Here was an article we wrote in Nature. Everybody wants to publish in Nature, but it does seem to be possible. Um, and uh, there are people you may be familiar with, Andy Haldane, who used to be chief economist at the Bank of England. But the point is that when you're taking policy measures, you should try and think about how the system reacts to what you're doing, and then try and build in measures which will uh, take account of the way in which the system reacts, and not just say, oh, well, that's gone wrong, we'll fix that. What you should do is, if we try and fix that like that, how will people react, and how will that affect the system? Next. Okay, definition from the Stockholm Resilience Center. How, I'm probably behind time now, right? Way behind time. Right. Okay. Sorry? Sorry, but ten minutes. Yeah. You've got a couple of minutes. Have I? Oh, wow. Well, that's good. Okay. Um, so the Stockholm Resilience Center tried to actually define what they meant by resilience. And they say a capacity to persist, adapt, or transform in the face of change in a way that maintains the basic identity of a system. In the case of social, ecological resilience, we're interested in really enabling long-term human survival and well-being as part of the biosphere. So it's quite closely linked to sustainability. But resilience in that sense may not necessarily be desirable. And the example that she gave, I think, was persistent poverty is an example of a social state that's both resilient and undesirable. So you have to be careful. You say, we would love to get, get this into a state where uh, it's uh, resilient in the sense that it won't be changed anymore. But if you're in a bad state, you don't want to do that. Next, please. <clears throat> And uh, it's often said that it's the resilience of a system is a reflection of the resilience of the individuals that make up the system. But that is, again, going against what I just said before, which means that when you have a lot of people interacting, you can no longer rely on the resilience quote of the individuals. But this reflects the idea that you can start from the individuals, and if you understand well enough how they work, you'll understand the way the system works. But physicists since Poincaré have been saying, no, this is not true. Next, please. And the behavior of the system is actually determined. This is a quote from a book on emergence. It's determined by the nature of the interactions, not by what is contained within the components. So don't spend your time looking at the individual ant, because you're not going to learn about a lot about the ant's nest by doing that. But the point is the interactions are rich, dynamic, fed back, and above all, nonlinear. The behavior of the system as a whole cannot be predicted from an inspection of its components. The notion of emergence is used to describe this aspect. The idea is that uh, aggregate behavior emerges from the system, but can't be just a blown up version of the, well, the individual ant, let's say, since we mentioned ants already today. <clears throat> I want to just make this remark, which I think a lot of people have been puzzled by. And Barack Obama was sufficiently intelligent and coherent to actually put it into words. He says, we remain the most prosperous, powerful nation on earth. Our workers are no less productive than when this crisis began. Our minds are no less inventive. Our goods and services no less needed than they were last week or last month or last year. Our capacity remains undiminished. But our time of standing pat, of protecting narrow interests, and putting off unpleasant decisions, that time has surely passed. Unfortunately, I don't think it has. But And yet the economy, when even as Obama was saying that was falling apart, and this is the real challenge, how did that happen? What Obama, uh, Obama did not put uh, his finger on was the underlying problem. Who or what was responsible? And the point is the crises arise as the whole system tries to self-organize 
and it's not caused by some outside event. But these outside events can trigger, even if they're small, a crisis. But so he was puzzled by the fact that the system works and suddenly something goes wrong and uh, we don't need or we don't really know how to handle it. And when we heard uh, Clara talking about uh, <coughs> the uh, crises that we have and austerity and so forth, austerity is our way of dealing with these things, but it's just a knee jerk reflex. Thanks. And the uh, next thing is that in, in order to make some sort of policy recommendations, you have to do some sort of forecasting, forecasting one would think. But Ben Bernanke, who should be one of the people, and he is indeed doing a survey right now, uh, as I understand it, of the Bank of England on this subject. But he said, one of the lessons of my life is you never know what's going to happen. And again, for somebody who was responsible for the Treasury, uh, the, uh, that's not sort of comforting. And he also said, I just think it's not realistic to think that human beings can fully anticipate all possible interactions and complex developments. The best approach for dealing with uncertainty is to make sure that the system is fundamentally resilient and we have as many fail says and backup arrangements as possible. And of course, he had in mind backup arrangements arranged by the government, and that didn't appeal to the neoliberals. Next. And again, here, this is a quote from Jerome Powell in 2022. And he said, we have always understood that restoring price stability whilst achieving a relatively modest increase in unemployment and a soft landing would prove to be challenging. No one knows where this process, whether this process will lead to a recession, or if so, how significant that recession would be. That's what he said. Okay, so what he's saying is we don't know where we're going with what we're doing. And so what did he say? Okay, so we're going to take a firm stand and continue to do what we used to do. <laughs> and as Albert, as Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So this, I think, is a, a convenient addendum to what Clara was saying, that, you know, if you have one thing you do when something bad happens, and you don't have any other ideas, you just do the same thing all over again, which is not a good idea in the economic contents context. And here are two people who somehow understood that there was something going wrong. Sianna Marin, who was uh, the Prime Minister of Finland and then resigned, she said there's something seriously wrong, wrong with the prevailing ideas of monetary policy when central banks protect their credibility by driving economies into recession. So in other words, we are victims of the central bank's desire to be credible. And Macron followed up on that by saying, I'm concerned to see lots of experts and certain European monetary policymakers explaining to us that we need to break demand in Europe to better contain inflation. Next. So conclusion. One's always tempted to look for simple explanations and simple solutions, and that would be the ideal for policies if we could find such solutions. But as soon as we think we have a grasp on some, some part of how the whole overall system works, we find that there's some feedback to some other part, which means we have to revise our arguments. We should not hope for optimal solutions, but rather look for robust improvements. Just as an example of what these indirect results can you imagine that when suddenly there were tractors all over the place in France with the, the farmers sort of driving their tractors to block things everywhere? And when people tried to look at this and, oh, it's Ukraine. Pardon? What are these people there for? So they're, they're there because they haven't got a high enough salary, no? Yeah, but that's all due to the Ukraine, you know? Oh, it's due to the Ukraine. Why the Ukraine? Because now we're allowing all that Ukraine wheat and stuff to get into France and that's undermining the price of wheat for the poor farmers and so the farmers are out in the street so you know if you think of those sort of chains of interaction that are going on I mean it's almost inimaginable that we could derive policies which would take care of that but in fact the government is obliged to take care of it, and indeed they've done so in France and it's not clear that it, that's going to help us much in the long run but when looking at social economic problems, I think we should all re always remember one other thing, 
And it was, uh, Clara, I think, who mentioned this too. Whenever we try to tackle a crisis it's all, and we find a way out, it's almost always those at the bottom of the hierarchy who suffer the worst consequences. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely terrific. Um, Henrietta. I wonder, this is Henrietta Moore. She is the founder and director of the IGP. And so perhaps this is a good chance for me to spring a surprise on you <laughs> and see if you would like to say a few words at the end. But before you do, so I'll give you a little bit of time to think. Are there any questions that people would like to ask uh, Alan? Any back there? No. I can't believe no, I can't believe it's. <laughs> this is a great opportunity. So, oh, yes. Thank you so much, questions and comment. Um, thank you very much. A nicely eloquent uh, talk. I agree with that very much indeed. Um, and this, uh, the language here um, that one hears amongst economists is tax burn, as if implying we get nothing actually for it, but it's actually used to, you know fund the education system and health service. Even Keir Starr was talking about uh, tax burden about the other day. And the other thing, uh, this notion of optimality, does that actually involve having complete information? Should I part that particularly? Well, you well yeah, that's very, yeah, two very quick answers to that. You're, I, I think you're absolutely right um, that the tax burden, as, as people say, when we're making an investment, this gets confused, okay? So suddenly we're saying this is a tax burden. But when I was little, as you said, and you can remember that too, we used to be taught in school, this is what the, um, the taxes go, go on, the income tax goes on, and this and this and this, and we get revenue from tobacco, we get revenue from this. And that's what's happening. And we spend money on defense, health, and so forth. And we all, all the little, little kids would say, What's defense? You know, what's, <laughs> which doesn't mean defense, of course. But anyway, the point is, you're right. People talk about a tax burden as if anything the state takes is somehow cost to you and, and you're getting nothing in return. So I agree, that's just a question of our, our, the way our education has gone. And, uh, and the second question is. The word optimality. Optimality, right. Yeah, but optimality is kind of crazy. I mean, in a world which is changing all the time, where all the parameters are changing, where policies are changing, things are happening all the time, it's not possible even to think about what really what you mean by optimizing. And how are you going to write down a problem which you're going to solve? You know, does, to, to me, that doesn't make any sense. But maybe I'm just, I'm sure I have many colleagues at UCL who would say, you don't understand anything, Kerman. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have one more question now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, can I just, um, I'm just so touched by the examples you used in your talk, uh, in particular, the quote from President Obama uh, that you've spent a few minutes on. And I just want to offer an observation on it, because uh, I think it's very deeply related to Clara's presentation earlier. Um, and I say this from a position of some knowledge. I, I, I oversaw, I was one of the people overseeing the TARP, the bailout. Uh, for the for the United States Congress. And the thing about that quote from Obama is, A, that it presaged his deciding to respond to that crisis by seeking to restore a fanciful equilibrium, right? Which I think goes right to the heart of your of your presentation. He decided to restore a fanciful equilibrium. He thought that was the technocratic solution. And he told Joe Stiglitz that at lunch in the White House. He said, well, you know, it may not be fair, but it's smart, uh, literally. What he didn't realize, and, I, and I, I, I believe this to be deeply true, was that he was caught in a power dynamic of the kind that Clara was describing earlier. And the people who had the power played him. And the result of that is that we are now facing a... a and the result of that and the underlying genuine problem in American political economy, which produced a financial crisis and various other things, 
is that now we have to deal with Donald Trump. Right? That, and your your quote, right? You're you're putting that on screen, I think, and I'm just sort of paying tribute to your presentation in many respects, brings together the the themes of this this afternoon, right? It 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 takes what Clara was saying and gives it tangible and, and form in our time. And so I, just from the perspective of someone who was there, I can just tell you, you have it spot on. Thanks for saying that, but I, I'm I actually, I'm in, I think it's what really intriguing this sort of play back and forth, where each person is pushing their thing onto the other person. So, you know, people are told technocratic solutions you know that may be what we might need right now, for example, and and they would they buy that, and I think in some sense Obama pulled that too. Right? President Obama believed deeply that Larry and Tim were bringing to him expertise the way that say Einstein brought expertise to Roosevelt about the atomic bomb, and what they were actually bringing to him was the short-term financial interest of the of the executives of Citigroup. And he did not understand the difference. No. Well, thanks. I mean, that's a, a perfect, uh, was it, kind of codicil to what I said. So thanks a lot. Anyway. Yes. Well, thank so you very much. Before we start, can we all just thank Alan Hong? Yes. <laughs> Well, I have to say, it's rare to hear an economic presentation which actually makes the entire audience laugh, not once, but several times. So I think that is a real achievement in the, in what happened this afternoon. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute for Global Prosperity and Rebuilding Macroeconomics is one of our jewels in the crown, so to speak. Um, and I think that it is one of the big issues that we have to face is the relationship between expertise, as you've just said, and elite capture. That is the repetition of models which have not worked for a very, very long time. And this, the equilibrium model is only just one. There are others that are equally concerning. And if you look around the global south, for example, the idea that all societies are going to go through a series of steps. So eventually, you know, if all the peasants will get off the land and then they'll go and be industrial in process of industrialization, then they'll go into the service sector and then they'll all be employed and then it will be happy ever after. And of course, this hasn't happened either, right? And not only is it not happening in the global south and the whole of development policy has been based on that theory, but it's not happening here. We seem to be going backwards in some sense and we don't really understand what that process is about. And the whole push for full employment, which is connected to the point that Alan was making, the whole push for full employment all the time is another of these chimera of the sort that Clara was talking about. Because, um, you know, we've suddenly seen this reversal in the UK it happened about two weeks ago. Suddenly the press started saying, guess what? You know, the labor market has cooled massively and unemployment is rising. So this was exactly the austerity argument that she was making. And yet we know very well that actually all those pr pronouncements about the labor market are, well, to say that they've got very little to do with what's actually going in the, on in the labor market would be the most polite way of understanding it. And some of the work that we do, for example, in the Institute for Global Prosperity and that macro rebuilding macro sits alongside is that we have, you know, families in East London where people have not one job, but three jobs and they still can't pay for things. So if you're talking about the idea that, you know, the answer to want is to get into the to get into employment and the labor market will solve all of this. It's clear that we don't really understand what's happening in modern labor markets any more than we understand what's happening in financial models or or anything else. So the very idea that we would actually seek to break the demand in order to bring inflation down is not just worrying. It's actually, frankly, terrifying. And if you're not an economist, it leaves you with a deep sense of disquiet because We've been told all along that the economists really are the people who understand what's going on. But I think the larger point is that economic systems are about people interacting with each other. And so we have to come back to that process of interaction. And that's why we're very persuaded in rebuilding macroeconomics that we want to explore what we're calling this field of social macroeconomics and to look at ways in which we try to address some of the challenges we have in our societies, not by just coming with an economic model, 
but by starting from a process of social innovation. Can we do things differently? Can we socially innovate to make those changes that we need? So I just want to thank you all for being here, supporting rebuilding macroeconomics and say, it's wonderful to be able to have these conversations. And I really sit, apologize to Michael, I wasn't here earlier, but I was doing something else as sometimes happens on these occasions. And uh, perhaps I could hand back to Angus to thank everyone. Thank you all very much indeed for coming and for all of your questions and taking part and particularly the speakers, Michael, Clara, and of course, Aaron. Have a wonderful day and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you.